Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of John Acrafa. I am Noel Thingwall. Joining me, as always, is J.D. DeMont. Hello! So, we are continuing our look at these kind of odds and ends of the Halloween franchise leading up to our episode on the Halloween 2018 film. And this is where I'm going to be covering some already tread ground. For those who have been following me for a while, you might remember that I got my start on a podcast series called I Hate Love Remakes. Which, J.D., I believe you were on at least once or twice? Yes, once. We were gonna do another one, but that That's didn't right. happen. Was it gonna be Evil Dead? Yep. We never got to Evil Dead, but we did Fright Night. Yep. Well, I should point out, we did do a John Carpenter trilogy on I Hate Love Remakes, which was a show where we would take the original film and the remake and we compare, contrast, discuss. And we did cover the Halloween remake. I should point out, we also covered the original and remakes of Assault on Precinct 13 and The Fog. I still haven't decided yet if I'm going to do another episode on The Fog and Assault on Precinct 13. We'll see. We still have a shocking amount of John Carpenter-related stuff to cover. <laughs> I actually asked you if I could be on the Halloween episode of I Hate Love Remakes. You already had somebody scheduled to be yeah. on there, but that was the first time I had actually said, Hey, if you want me to be a part of your show, I'd be interested. And I've regretted it ever since. <laughs> You're stuck with me now. I know. But no, I want to give a quick shout out to Lori Bowen, who was our guest on that episode. Unfortunately, I was still early in my podcasting days, so I hadn't quite cut down on interrupting people and answering my own questions. So I did a lot of talking on that, even more so than I do now, and wish I'd opened up the floor more to everyone else to say things. But still, she was a wonderful guest. She also did our Nightmare on Elm Street episode. A wonderful filmmaker out there. Everyone check out her stuff. Look up Lori Bowen. Really, really nice person. Wonderful filmmaker. Big shout out to her. So why are we covering Rob Zombie's Halloween again, even though I did that previous episode? Well, one, that was seven years ago. Enough time has passed. I would prefer 27 years, but, you know. <laughs> but also because we're getting into some stuff that I haven't seen yet that this is kind of an important stepstone to. I've never seen Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. I've never read Halloween 3D, which was the script that was going to be the third film. And we are going to be covering both of those here. And so we figured, you know what, let's go back. Let's talk about the Rob Zombie film. And plus, we probably should make an actual episode of Genocrypha for it instead of just, yeah, hey, go back and listen to I Hate Love Remakes. Because also, that was a very early episode. I was not really quite as honed as I am now. And given how awful I am now, that was very bad. Hey, at least you got me now to make yourself look even better. I know, I know, but I just edit you to make that. <laughs> so, JD, had you ever seen the Rob Zombie Halloween films before? Yeah, I've seen the first one. I got it from Netflix probably close to 10 years ago, mm. shortly after it hit DVD. And I had watched the original right before it, so I had thoughts right at that time, and yeah. I'm sure we'll get into them soon. That remakes episode was the first time I had ever seen it. What's funny is before the film even came out, a draft of the screenplay had leaked. I got about 20 pages into it before something happened where I just closed it, said nope, <laughs> <laughs> and just did not continue beyond that point. I did not reread that script in prep for this. However, I did read his treatment for it simply because it's shorter mm -hmm. and it still had that scene in it that made me say nope, which is not a scene that is in the finished film, but I will definitely bring it up. I'm so excited to hear what that is. Oh, yeah. Yay. Rob Zombie, I have no ill will towards the man. I think he's been a very strong creator of music, comics, his film career. He has a very distinctive style, a distinctive voice. It's just not one that I particularly share or am interested in. But I don't begrudge him having his style and his fans. I have never seen another Rob Zombie film. I've never seen House of a Thousand Corpses or Devil's Rejects. 
never seen, what is it, Lords of Salem or something like that? Yeah. I did see a couple of his music videos back in the day, because I remember that one, Burn with the Witches and Damn mm-hmm. with the Witches, something like that. I can't remember how the rest of it goes, but I remember that video was a big MTV staple for about three months. Oh, yeah. It was probably longer than that. Yeah, yeah. That was a big hit. That was around the time of The Matrix, if I recall. Yeah, I think that was actually the only video I've ever seen. I know he directed it, and I know that was a reputation where he was an artist who started directing his own videos, which wasn't that common of a thing at the time. Right. And he had that very grimy, grindhouse style, but I remember like that particular video had this very neon black light tinge to it. So it's like Alice Cooper. Kudos to Alice Cooper. He is his own thing. I've never really been that interested in Alice Cooper or his music. Not that I hate it, not that I dislike it, just not my thing. Same with Rob Zombie. What are your feelings on Robin? Have you seen any of his other films? I've seen some of his music videos. Mm -hmm. I watched his short, The Werewolf Woman of SS. Yes, I've seen that too. In Grindhouse, which I thought was amusing, but it was also a short. Nicolas Cage's Fu Manchu. Yeah, that's the only (laughs) part I can really remember, to be honest. But I don't dislike his style necessarily. I think that the griminess that's in a lot of his films, it's something that I have to be in the right frame of mind. Because otherwise, it just feels gross. So I haven't really ever gathered the nerve to sit down and watch House of a Thousand Corpses or Devil's Rejects, which I've had friends who I tend to trust say, like, these are great films. Mm -hmm. But I have a feeling I would need to be in the right frame of mind before I could actually sit down and watch it. And I just have never managed to do that. So thank you for being on this show where we're going to discuss two Rob Zombie films twice. Yay! I should point out, for Halloween and Halloween 2, both of these are known for having director's cuts and theatrical cuts that have some significant differences between them. So we're following this layout that Alex and I did for Halloween 6. Right now, we've watched the director's cut, and we're going to discuss the director's cut, and then we'll come back in a couple of weeks for a segment on the theatrical cut. And the reason why we're doing that in reverse is because that's technically the order in which they were made. So it's like, we're looking at what he handed to the studio, and then we're going to look at what the studio made of that and just get a sense of how they tweaked and reshaped it. Because I know especially Halloween 2, again, I haven't seen it. I don't know what the differences are. I just know I hear that there's some significant differences. Right. And also, you were saying that the director's cut is the more widely available version. So if you're going to watch the movie for this podcast, that'll be the version you're probably more likely to find. I actually had to track down the old DVD releases for both of these just to get the theatrical cuts. Yeah, Rob somehow managed to finagle it where the director's cuts are the most widely available ones, even when they did the Halloween Blu-ray box set, that massive, wonderful box set where it was Miramax and Shout Factory and Universal collaborated on that one. Mm -hmm. They did not include the theatrical cuts of both of those at Rob's request. So obviously those are not his preferred cuts. Setting off a million completionists that is all shivered right now. Just you saying that. One again, I'm a completionist. This is my podcast. We're doing it complete. (laughs) All or nothing. We're going to do it. I may not like it, but we'll see. Hey, it's not my fault that John Carpenter is still making comics. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he just keeps dragging out how many more episodes you and I are going to have to do in the future, JD. We'll be in the retirement home talking about the 31st Tales reboot. of a Halloween night, issue 37. <laughs> I remember back a year ago when we had 36. <laughs> there were only three chapters in there. I figure you should add a chapter a year, so issue 36 should have 36 chapters. Rap scallions. <laughs> So why did Rob Zombie make a Halloween film? Well, because Halloween Resurrection was Halloween Resurrection, and nobody was really excited for another sequel. The mid-2000s was when we saw a whole wave of remakes. Rob Zombie had kind of exploded onto the film scene in the early 2000s with House of a Thousand Corpses, which initially screened at festivals and had such an extreme reaction of people who both loved it and hated it that I think it was Universal originally produced that, that the studio dropped the movie and he had to go and find another distributor to release the movie. Hmm. It still ended up doing well. It became an instant cult hit, still has fans to this day, and then he followed it up with Devil's Region which was him taking like the same type of characters but doing a completely different tonal type of horror movie doing a much more rougher in your face horror movie whereas the other one was a little more goofy and playful yeah that one again had very strong reactions of people who loved it and people who hated it people who still argue as to which is the better movie because they're so different in style again it did well it got a cult following and that led him to miramax dimension and the weinstein brothers Oh, 
I thought Michael Myers was the horror film, but now we see the true villain. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just let this be the one and only moment in this show that we bring up the Weinsteins. Harvey Weinstein, of course, as many know, has had numerous, numerous reports against him about rape, harassment, assault, just absolute monster of a human being is currently facing charges for a number of those accusations, and I hope they lock him away for a good long time. Me too. And Bob Weinstein, of course, has faced a lot of accusations for not doing the same acts, but for covering up or ignoring his brother's acts, doing a lot of more corporate collusion and all that stuff. Mm. Basically, their name has become absolute shit in the industry, and rightfully so. Yeah. Again, it was their studio, Miramax, which had its imprint Dimension, which was the big horror label going back to the 90s when they did the Scream films. I think they had taken over the Hellraiser movies. They had taken over the Halloween movies starting with part six. So they did six, seven, and eight, and then this reboot. Malak Akkad is still producing this one, just because he still owned the rights. He, again, is the son of Mustafa Akkad, who tragically, before Halloween 8 was released, was killed in a terrorist attack. So there's a lot of... <laughs> A tragedy in this franchise, unfortunately, kind of peripheral to it. And then also, I should mention producer Andy Gould, who was Rob Zombie's producer on House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Reject, and has continued on, did Lords of Salem and 31 with him. So he was Rob Zombie's main creative partner. Wine scenes were just executive producing. He was kind of given a bit of a free hand. He even, before he started work on the film, went to John Carpenter to get his blessing, and John was like, just make it your own. John's opinion on that has changed in recent years. <laughs> Again, this movie is written, directed by, produced by Rob Zombie. He was also the music supervisor. I don't have a written synopsis. To be fair, while it is a very different film, it's not that different of a story. It's kind of a prequel, but also a remake of the original. We start with young Michael Myers. He's living in a troubled home. Mother is a stripper who's trying to make ends meet. She's got an abusive boyfriend. His older sister, Judith, is constantly picking on him. His only real connection is Boo, also known as Lori, who is his younger baby sister. And Michael is himself an outcast. He's bullied at school. He's constantly taunted and mocked and beaten upon. He wears masks to hide away from everyone. And unfortunately, he's begun to have destructive outlets in the form of cutting up small neighborhood animals and family pets. And this culminates on a day where Michael is not only caught by the principal who reveals his collection of dissected animal photographs to his mother and introduces the mother to Dr. Sam Loomis, a child psychiatrist, but Michael also decides to lure the school bully into the woods and beat him to death with a stick. This culminates on Halloween night, which is soon after, where Michael is dressed in his clown costume and his mask and is eager to go out and trick-or-treating, but he's again ignored, again tossed aside. While his mother is out working, Michael comes home, finds his sister having sex upstairs with her boyfriend, and Michael proceeds to kill his mother's boyfriend, he kills his sister's boyfriend, and then he kills his own sister. And when his mom returns home and discovers him, Michael ends up being institutionalized, again going under the care of Dr. Sam Loomis. Sam tries for years to try to break through to Michael, but Michael increasingly retreats into silence and behind his mask. When his mother finally witnesses one of his violent outbursts at the hospital, she ends up realizing that her child is a monster and commits suicide. And it gets to a point where Loomis feels that he's done everything he can for Michael and none of it has worked. So Loomis retires and ends up writing a very successful book about Michael Myers, which ends up funding his retirement, which also kind of makes him a controversial figure. Well, one night, a bunch of guards decide to rape a woman in Michael's room and end up setting him free. So Michael kills all the guards, goes back to Haddonfield, starts stalking his long-lost sister, Lori Strode, who is babysitting children on Halloween night with a number of other babysitters. And again, the story kind of plays out the same way as Michael starts killing all the other babysitters, setting up a tableau so that he can ultimately corner Lori, not to kill her initially, but so that he can reveal that he is her long-lost brother, but because she was a baby at the time, she doesn't recognize him. So she ends up fighting back and it ends up becoming a big cat and mouse game between the two of them leading up to the big finale where they've both fallen over a balcony and she is sitting on top of Michael emptying empty chamber after empty chamber into his face until one finally clicks and blows his head off. Supposedly. We'll get to the sequel. So, JD, do you recommend Rob Zombie's Halloween? I do not. 
I think there is an interesting film in here. The first half, it's not a good Halloween film, but there is the skeleton of something that could have been fleshed out and made into an original property that could have been really interesting. Unfortunately, once you get to the halfway point, it then becomes Halloween, but less good. Yeah. It's just a repeat of everything we've seen before with none of the tension or the pacing that was so great in that first film. It's trying to do an hour and a half in less than an hour, and it just doesn't do it well. And it fails that last half. But I do think that the first half does have some merit. It's just you got to dig through a lot of crap to get there. What's interesting is for the remakes episode, I hated this movie. Mm -hmm. Revisiting it, I'm a little more at peace with it. I don't recommend it. I don't particularly like it. But I think I appreciate more what Rob was trying to do. And again, I don't think Rob is an untalented filmmaker. I do think he has this very unique style, and it's a style that he's honed and developed. And I actually think there's a lot of sequences in this film that are very well made and very well executed, not just in the first half, even in the second half. There are a lot of very interesting sequences, a lot of very nice photography, good uses of music, some genuinely good tension moments. I think my problem is that he just has such a fundamentally opposed view of Michael to this is where I'm going to be a full on fanboy to mine. I think he made a very good Jason Voorhees movie, <laughs> but he didn't make a very good Michael Myers movie. Because I think the problem that we've always found with the Halloween sequels is when they keep mistaking Michael Myers for Jason Voorhees mm -hmm. instead of appreciating the differences between the two. If that first half had been the backstory for a young Jason Voorhees, you know, obviously going a slightly different route and then ultimately leading to a kind of remake of Friday. Yeah, I would absolutely have put Rob Zombie on a remake of Jason Voorhees and it would have been very fitting. Yeah. This is not Michael Myers. And I don't say that as trying to be like, there's one true pure interpretation of Michael Myers. It's that there is a significant distinction between Michael Myers and Jason that people keep forgetting to make, and this one doesn't make that either. Right. That's my big thing is I don't think it's a badly made film. I think Rob Zombie, more my issue with him is just taste levels. There are areas where he pushes so far that instead of contributing to the horror and contributing to the storytelling, he's actually distracting from it. But there are other aspects where I think he actually is doing a very good job of playing out the scene, of envisioning certain things. So it's a very kind of mixed bag movie. It's a movie where there's actually a good, I'd say over half of it I actually like. I didn't mind watching it. I did enjoy the performances. I did enjoy the way it was being put together. I'd say maybe the remaining 30% is just so awful and garish to me that it does bring down everything else. And again, that's where we'd be curious to see the theatrical cut because they took out 11 minutes of this movie. And I could see like that might make it a lot better. Yeah. I really think two hours is a long time for a horror film in general and is one that rolls in its own excess as much as this one does yeah. at times. I think that could have only helped this film out. Let's set aside the backstory for the moment. Like in the second half of the movie, what did you think about his characterization and vision of Michael Myers? I agree with you. I think that this Michael, we see him move fast several times. And that's one thing I've always liked about Michael is that he's slow and methodical. While in this one, there's none of that building up. You see him in the background or you see like his boot in the foreground or something like that. It's just you get a shot of the character and then he just runs in and slams into him. Mm -hmm. It's very WWE in your face, just extreme action horror, as opposed to the gradual turning the dial up until all of a sudden you're just sitting there in anticipation for the strike. Like you said, this is not the first time that they've done that, but it stood out to me a lot more in this one than almost any other film in this franchise. Yeah, and I think that's one of the big mistakes that people can make is, it's not that Michael Myers is slow, it's that he's patient. Right. The problem is when they interpret that slowness as almost zombie-like or Terminator-like. No, yeah. Even in the original film, there are moments where he does spring. I mean, he never runs, but it's like, you know, when he springs up from behind the couch, when he's breaking yeah. through the closet. There's moments where he is actively moving and the times in which he's slow are because he's waiting for the moment it's not like he's the it follows monster where he's just always moving at the same pace it's just michael likes to find the moments yeah he's like a cobra waiting to strike yeah. he's always on guard he's always ready for it and he can move damn fast when he's ready for it but he doesn't just strike at anything he waits right. for the right opportunity right and that was always a problem with halloween 4 and halloween 6 and halloween 8 was they made him mechanical and he's never mechanical. He's patient and he's methodical. Right. And he's a planner. 
This one, what I like is that he's not mechanical. I like that there is a person to Michael. There is a humanity to Michael. Not not really an empathetic one, but he is a person. But again, they went the Jason Voorhees route of where he is just this very brutish. It's all about anger and lashing out. And there's a sadness to him and while also just exploding into these rages. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a bad character study. But again, that would have been a great way to explore Jason Voorhees. Yeah. Or an entirely new character. Like, it doesn't have to be Michael Myers. And that's one of the things I said about the first half, is that they set up a character that could have been a really great slasher villain. It's just not Michael Myers. Yeah, it falls into that misunderstanding of what the original film was doing versus what other horror franchises were doing. And also, I'm not saying that Tyler Mayne gives a bad performance at all. No. I want to see something where him and David Harbour play brothers, because God, they look alike. Imagine that Hellboy sequel. Uh, (laughs) There you go. But I don't know, other than just the wacky visual of it, other than the cheap visual of it, I don't know what the drive was to make Michael Myers like a six foot eight, 280 pound wrestler. Yeah. Other than just to explain like how he's able to... That's one problem I have with this is that Zombie has a tendency to want to try to strip away all the supernatural, occulty type elements, which admittedly was very light in the original film. Well, but the original there was film, just a, it's not even supernatural. It's just odd. It's eerie. Right. And this is just trying to explain like why he can survive like getting stabbed and being able to lift somebody up and stab them through into the wall or something like that. Exactly. Whereas, you know, what made that eerie in the first movie when he lifted the guy up and stabbed him through the wall is that he's a normally built guy. Right. And that's what makes it eerie. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he keeps getting up after everything that's thrown at him is what makes it strange. Again, that's where I think so much of what drove Michael in the original is just will. He's literally willing himself to this goal that he wants to achieve. Right. And yeah, he's probably bleeding out and dying, but he still wants to see this through. Even here, though, they don't really use that as a justification because he doesn't really get shot or stabbed until the very end of the movie. Right. And all in ways that he would probably be able to still walk off because, like, every bullet, like, clips his shoulder, you know? Mm -hmm. I think he gets shot in the one shoulder three times. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't think it was necessary. I would much prefer the slight build of Michael Myers. And I think that it's easier for me to believe, like, that kid that we see in the beginning would grow up into... I just don't see him growing up into Tyler Mayne. Right. Again, Jason Voorhees is the social reject. Mm -hmm. He was the child who was born with deformities, who was mocked and neglected. And that led to him coming back and pouring all the rage from that mocking and neglection to the point where he literally became a zombie of (laughs) retribution. (laughs) Not to get too cultural about it, but he became a very almost golem-like tearing down all the social mores of youthful indiscretion Mm -hmm. to a ridiculous degree. And Michael, he wasn't. That was never the character of Michael. Michael is a planner. He's mischievous. He's a chess player. He basically is like laying out dominoes and then just pushes one. Mm Mm-hmm. He is V. (laughs) He is you. He is me. He's your mother. (laughs) No, I'm sorry. (laughs) But I mean, this comes to my confusion in that if you're going to do this deep examination of what brought Michael to this state, it doesn't work if you're bringing him to the state that he never was at in the beginning. Right. You're setting up the backstory of a character in a way that so fundamentally changes the character that that backstory no longer fits. That, I think, is my biggest issue with the movie. Set aside everything else that I have with it. It's not that it's a bad movie. It's not that it's a bad horror movie. I just don't think it is a good Michael Myers movie. Yeah, I agree 100%. This is Rob Zombie trying to deconstruct Michael Myers, but he deconstructed him so much that the pieces don't come together right now. I think it's like he deconstructed it and then like, you know, his cat knocked over a box of puzzle pieces for Friday the 13th and they kind of got all mixed together and he just grabbed a rubber mallet and was just like, damn it, I'll make it work. (laughs) I get it, but it just doesn't work for me. Otherwise, I don't mind the visual of him. I don't mind the kind of rotted mask. I don't mind the dusty hair. I don't mind the dirty jumpsuit. I even don't, for as much as I think it's the wrong approach to have Michael be this gigantic guy who's literally smashing through walls with his bare fists. Right. I still think some of those scenes are very effectively done, like when he's chasing Laurie through the house in the end and like smashing through the ceiling and all that stuff. It is effectively executed. Yeah. And even some of the bits where, you know, in the original film, it's like characters will be walking down a street and you'll just kind of see Michael in the background. In this one, I kind of like that they did it a bit differently where you'll still see him moving. You'll see a casual Michael just following people, just standing (laughs) on a hill. And not even like set up that people notice him. That's almost what's scarier is nobody's noticing that he's just walking casually down the street during daylight. 
I kind of like the effectiveness of that. Mm -hmm. So, Jeannie, what did you think about Dag Ferrick as the young Michael Myers in this backstory? I thought he did a really good job with the role that he was given. Again, I think the part that I liked the best about the original Halloween was that you had a cherubic looking young child who does this unexplained thing for no understandable reason. And this kid is not given that role. He mm -hmm. is very much already well into buying stuff from Hot Topic long before he picks up a knife. <laughs> he is super goth and emo and everything. But the kid is actually a really good actor, I think. Like, there are times where he switches between cold, dead shark eyes and being like, well, when can I go home? You know, mm -hmm. and being all innocent and a normal kid. He does it without it feeling artificial. I think he did a really good job with the role. Yeah. Him and Rob do a good job of really portraying this kid struggling with an emotional disorder where he is having these strong swings of violent emotion, mm -hmm. sadness to violence to clinginess to just being a normal kid. And he's kind of almost lost to this. And I think there's a real tragedy in yeah. that, like watching this kid spiral. He's getting lost in the darkness. Yeah. There is a true tragedy in that story. And I think Zombie actually does a really good job of portraying that on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's just that, again, it's not Michael Myers. I want to see the movie that that leads to because it's like the moment you time jump, I instantly don't buy that that kid grows up to be Tyler Mann. <laughs> exactly. No. It's like, I want to see where that kid actually is 15, 20 years later and have this be a backstory to a character. It's just not Michael Myers. Mm -hmm. And again, I think one of the important things that's often overlooked with Michael Myers is he was just a normal suburban kid, middle class suburban home who just one day did this thing. Because, mm -hmm. you know, even when we got into the Stephen Hutchison comics, he added this creepy, lascivious nature to it where Michael had seen his sister masturbating when she had her first period and trying to get into this backstory and setup. And it's like, Michael Myers works best when he doesn't have a backstory that goes any further than he was a kid who one day just stabbed his sister and kept going on. Well, tell that to the Cult of Thorn. Yeah. No, you're right. I think that Michael works best the less you explore his character. He's yeah. best when he is an agent of chaos, where he is kind of like the Joker, but instead of being out there wacky, his jokes are more about slow pranks that involve knives and stabbing. When you give him this detailed backstory, where it's a more understandable, he's a psychopathic or a sociopath or whatever the terminology is, that's more believable. But again, it's not Michael Myers. Yeah, it's I not. think you lose a lot when you try to give a reason for why he does what he does. And again, it's a good backstory for Jason Voorhees. You know, I mean, obviously it would take a different turn instead of like killing his entire family at the house. He goes to summer camp and then his mom goes mad. But again, it's like everything up to the point where he does the big final Halloween night, mm -hmm. even beating up the bully in the woods. You could have that be the start of the Friday the 13th prequel movie. Yeah. And then, you know, his mom is like, you know, hey, we think we need to get you out of this place. Let's send you a summer camp. And then that goes bad. And then we get the story of Pamela Voorhees mm -hmm. and what led to her becoming the killer trying to avenge her son, not knowing that her son is actually still living out there in the woods, growing into this bitter rage monster. Mm -hmm. Again, Rob, I think would have been the perfect person to make that movie. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that would have probably been a better version yeah. than what we got of this Halloween film. Because again, Jason Voorhees was the reject. He was the castaway who came back to remind people that you can't cast away people without biting you in the ass, you know? Mm -hmm. Even doing away with all the deformity vision that people always portray Jason Voorhees as, I can see this kid, no makeup, Yeah, this being young Jason Voorhees. Yeah, I totally agree. I think he would have done a really good job with that too. I really think he did a great job yeah. in this role. It's just, again, it's not Michael Myers. No, and I looked him up, even though he only has a handful of film and TV credits, even before he was in this, he was a constant stage actor and to this day continues to be a very prolific stage actor, does a lot of Shakespeare. He's a very theatrically trained actor. I can believe it. I'm glad that he's still out there. He's still acting. He's still doing well. I even saw some pictures of him. He still has the long blonde hair. He still looks exactly the same. He's just older and leaner. Yeah. I see the picture of him. He looks almost Tarzan-y, but mm -hmm. still looking like he did in that film. He's just an adult version of that. Yeah. He looks like half the boyfriends in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
this is where I can get why, one, I think Rob genuinely was attached to the story he was telling. I think he is genuinely putting his heart on the page, and I absolutely respect him for that in terms of the character that he's building. But again, it's such a different character that you're building towards that it doesn't work as a backstory. Mm -hmm. This is where we're going to start getting into the trademark white trash quality of Rob Zombie storytelling, which again, I don't begrudge. That's his style. That's his aesthetic. Go for it. But it's not as interesting of a story where your backstory for Michael Myers is that he has Ronnie, the, the the abusive boyfriend of his stripper mother, who's ogling the teenage daughter. And it's like, just, oh, come on. Yeah. Even that treatment that I read opened up with exterior Michael Myers house day, white trash heaven. <laughs> God. Yeah. First lines of the script. It's trying to go for southern hillbilly stuff, but it's in the Midwest. And not to say that there aren't those people, but... Oh, yeah. I'm in Minnesota. We still have playing them up here. Yeah, but it's a radically different take than what we were presented with. And I don't know if it adds anything of value. No. It's one of those things where it's like, I understand it because it's Rob Zombie. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand it for why he thought the backstory of Michael Myers... Because the suburb aspect of Michael Myers is such a part of the Halloween franchise, too. Because mm -hmm. that's where you have all the houses clustered next to each other. That's where you have the trick-or-treating. Yeah. And again, he is very much stereotyping that aesthetic, too. Yeah. It's that aesthetic taken up to 11. I could see, like, if they had dialed it down to a 7, it would have been okay. It's just that it's so out there with, like, one of the first lines of dialogue being, I will crawl over there and skull fuck you. Yeah. Why? Yeah. And again, that's where there's a shrillness to Rob Zombie that I find unappealing. Again, there's garish and shrill movies that I enjoy, like Freaked or some of Sam Raimi's early movies or stuff like that, where it's just really gonzo and in your face. This is just gross. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the aesthetic that he wants to explore. Good for you. More power to you. I don't want that. And again, it would fit a Friday the 13th movie because those are known for being really gross and great. <laughs> right. Or Texas Chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. God, Rob Zombie's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. God, that's what House of the Thousand Corpses basically. Yeah, I was going to say that pretty much is already. <laughs> yeah. But the white suburban culture, and I'm not saying you couldn't update it to be more diverse, which he really doesn't. Yeah. But it's a key part of what made that. And having this redneck family just being as gross and like, it's there to show why Michael becomes yeah. as messed up as he is. But it's not even just them, but every character in this movie is cranked up to 11 and you have that. You have the banter between the girls all imitating sex acts in front of their parents. Joe Grizzly. Yeah, you have all these various side characters. You have the rapist guys in the institution, yeah. which we'll get to. He has this aesthetic where it's so cartoonish. There are times when he is doing a very serious and compelling character study, and then it'll just suddenly become Gonzo with a strap on, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, the actual Muppet Gonzo with a big flapping strap on. Yeah. That's that's basically the tonal shift that this will take. Yeah. It doesn't contribute to the story. It distracts from the story. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's a bad aesthetic to explore. I don't think he juggles the tone. That's the thing is you got to juggle those tone shifts. Right. And I think he loses control whenever that happens. And again, Halloween is very much as bland as that is as an explanation. It's very much a suburb movie. The safe community where we'll let our kids run around and get candy you know, it's it's very much the Stephen King community, you know, where mm -hmm. everything seems all bright and 50s and polished and everyone's houses look the same and it's all clean and well lit. And there's skeletons behind the closet and this one family. Yeah, by the way, their eight year old just stabbed his teenage sister to death. And we don't know why. He's not saying anything. He won't tell us. But he did it. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what film... I don't even think it has to be Friday the 13th. I think that this could have been a really good original film if you just stripped away all the Halloween elements from it. Yeah, you just have him keep that paper mache mask collection. Yeah. And you just have it be the killer where he just has this duffel bag full of these paper mache masks. Maybe he keeps making more as he goes along. And it's like every person that he kills, he's got a different mask for. Yeah. I actually kind of like the orange one that we see when he's in the asylum. Yeah, the jack-o'-lantern one. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was actually really cool. And to be honest, I liked it better than the updated version of the classic shape mask. Yeah. Again, I just keep coming back to this. It's not Michael Myers. 
By the way, the shape mask that they use in this movie, they did actually recast the original mold. Oh, that's cool. It's a good sculpt. I have no problem with the way the mask is in this movie, unlike some of the other sequels. Where yeah. <laughs> Boy, did they go off track. I didn't like the aging they did to it, but that's just nitpicking. Like, that's not my personal preference. God, imagine what Michael smells like in this movie. Uh, let's not imagine that. Because you mean, like, remember when he attacks the guy to get the jumpsuit, you know, his feet just covered mm. in mud. <laughs> And he steals the jumpsuit, and when we see the guy laying on the ground, he's got a big shit stain on his pants. Mm. So it's like, God, yeah, just ugh. And I also just don't get the motivator of he wants to find his sister to reconnect with his sister, which is a very simplistic way of looking at that. And he even has the photo, and in the original treatment, he even said the name Boo after he took his mask off. Huh. It's one of those things where, again, I think because Zombie wanted to deconstruct Halloween and give it like all these more realistic motivations and everything, by doing so, he ended up reducing it down. He made it less interesting, too. Yeah, it's like that original film, unless you watch the TV cut where they included some of the flashbacks and stuff. But the stuff that they added for Halloween, too, yeah. Right, yeah. For the most part, you don't really ever know why he's chasing Lori. She's just another girl of several that he's killed that evening. No, it, everything does seem to be leading towards Lori, and I think it's because she's the one who came up to the door and put the key under the rug. True. Everything else, you know, he follows Lori. It's through Lori he sees the other girl. Girls, and he uses the other girls to set up the tableau that he lures Lori into. Yeah, that's true. That is true. So it's all revolving around her. Now, as to why, John Carpenter did not make the original film with the intention of them being brother and sister. It's when he had to make part two. That was just a twist that he pulled out of his ass, which is not a bad twist, but it's one of those ones that the more you think about it, the more it starts to unravel because you have the secret adoption, especially then when Laurie had kids and all the sequels start to kind of unravel. Yeah. That original film really, yeah, you're right. It didn't really emphasize any of that. It was just basically a psychopath attacking a teenage girl. I mean, yeah, even people need to remember that the original, it started as the babysitter murders. Right. And it was just supposed to be a bunch of babysitters getting stalked. And then the character was recycled elements from what was meant to be a sequel to Black Christmas. Mm. And again, the killer in Black Christmas, we don't know who he is. We don't know why he's doing any of this. It's just this mysterious entity that is either on the other end of the phone or it pops out, kills people, and then goes back into hiding. Mm -hmm. I think John was very much playing on that idea of there doesn't need to be an answer. No. There doesn't need to be a reason. And again, we see that in the real world where it's like someone will just start stalking someone even if they've never met them and will just follow them for months before unleashing some act of violence against them. I mean, that's the thing I think people also forget about Michael Myers is that there's nothing he does in the first film that isn't human. And that's what makes it even more horrific because humans are capable of stuff like that. Like you said, there's an eeriness to him that's borderline yeah. supernatural, but it's never explicit. Everything is entirely possible that this is just a psychopath who's strong, he's patient, he's fast, and he takes his time. And he's a bit mischievous. Yeah. But this one... Even in the film, say, he's like an animal. He only is like base emotions. That's not Michael. Yeah. Okay, stripping away Michael Myers. Yeah, okay, again, that's what I like about this character is he's a very broken character. For all the anger that he has, there's also this sadness. Mm -hmm. There's these moments of confusion, these moments of almost longing. I like those moments. Yeah. I like those moments where when he's playing with a crime scene, because in the original film, you know, after he does the nailing the guy to the wall with the knife, there's that moment where he stops back and does the side to side head thing. There it had that kind of, again, eerie feel to it. Here, he had that rush of the violence going out, and now he's kind of almost reduced back to a casual childlike innocence where, you know, like he goes up to the guy who he strung up from the wall with the jack lanterns and he just starts pushing him just watch him spin yeah there's this bleeding woman lying at his feet screaming and he's just caught in the moment just eh. it's like he burns out and then needs to recharge this is again where i have the conflict even though i don't like this as michael i don't really have a problem as a film i like stuff like that both young michael and old michael i think give really interesting performances they both feel very human and I kind of like it. It's just that it's not the right thing for this franchise. In terms of like Rob doing a lot of things right and a lot of things wrong, I like the way they use the breathing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's way too many times where it's like while he's in the middle of attacking someone, he does like an old 1930s Frankenstein. Rah! Yeah, I noticed that too. Suddenly you become Peter Boyle and putting on the reds. I don't mean that hyperbolically. It literally every single time I would hear him do that, it took me out of it. Because again, Michael Myers, silent. Silent except for the breathing. Yeah. They do the silence and they do the breathing really well. But every single scene had at least once where it's like, Arr! 
And it's like, no, no, you had me. Yeah, the grunts <laughs> and all that stuff, that took me out of it every time I heard that. Every time. Especially because I was watching this with headphones and it's like crystal clear. <laughs> Rob Zombie, again, not an untalented person, but he has a thing. He doesn't know how to edit. He doesn't know how to rein himself in. Yeah, I think this would be interesting to see either a different director taking his script or the other way around where he's directing someone else's script. I don't even think he's a bad writer. No. I think more of his writing is good than isn't. I think he's a better director than he's a writer, though I did notice that the editing on this film is really weird at times. There's a lot of really sloppy cuts. There are, but I kind of liked it because I liked some of the odd things that he did with the camera where someone will walk into a room and there's like something close up blurry in the foreground. You know, it's like we're seeing past stuff. Yeah. Even in just like a casual moment, we're seeing people past things that are right up against the camera. It adds some claustrophobia. I actually don't mind the editing so much. I actually like moments where it's like someone will walk down a hall and they'll pass a hall where Michael is standing and you just get this brief flicker of him. They use this great little warped sound effect that I thought was really effective. He has a lot of really good flourishes and stuff. But then there's moments where you get the scene where Loomis is buying a gun from Mickey Dolan's <laughs> and he's like, what are you hunting? And then it just cuts. Normally, you'd let that breathe just a little bit. Even if it's just an expression on Malcolm McDowell's face or something like that, <laughs> sometimes it just cuts and it just feels odd. And immediately, maybe he's going for that. Well, they do have a longer version of that scene on the DVD. It does go on too long. Yeah. I think they cut it down to what it needed to be. I actually didn't mind ending it on that laugh note of, so what you hunting? I guess if he even had a brief pause, like it's almost immediately after he says that, it just cuts to the next scene. I mean, there were actually multiple scenes of Loomis staying at a hotel run by Adrian Barbeau. Oh. Rob likes to flesh out side characters. Mm -hmm. He likes to give little characters enough personality, but the side effect is that can make you kind of instantly interested in a character, and then when they're suddenly gone, you lose it. Mm -hmm. I would much rather have that glimpse of a much more interesting character than just have a flat rote moment. Yeah, fair enough. This is a film that the first cut was was three and a half hours long and there's a lot of deleted footage on the dvd even deleted from the director's cut i can believe it they had to tighten it up and this is as tight as rob was able to get it so he had to chop and chop and chop and chop and get it as tight as he could and yeah there's a few times where i'll admit it is a little choppy but again that's just because he had so much material he had to cut away from and then the studio took it and did a further cut for the theatrical cut we'll get to that mm-hmm I don't really mind the film on a technical level. I think the cinematography is good. I think the editing is good. In terms of Rob's instincts, there are times where he'll hold on moments too long. Like in the bully scene, it goes on too long. Yeah. You know, or killing, what's his name, Machete. Oh, yeah. Danny Trejo. Even though I like a lot of the stuff with Laurie and Michael in the house at the end, all of those Mm -hmm. scenes could have been tightened up a bit. I understand his instincts to let moments play, but sometimes he lets the wrong moments play. Yeah. But otherwise, technically, I like it. I love the score. I think they did a good job mixing the classic themes with a new score. I saw that this composer who did this one, he's the same guy who does all the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, the John Wick movies, Tyler Bates. I thought the score was fine. I did think that the use of the music was occasionally a bit too on the nose. When you have Don't Fear the Reaper, right, as young Michael is about to stab his sister. Or when she refuses to take him trick-or-treating and you have Love Hurts playing as he sits outside. I love that because it was so garishly out of a chair. That was one of those ones where it was so garishly weird of like, let's have a scene of young Michael Myers in his clown suit sitting dejectedly on a curb while everyone else is enjoying Halloween except him as Love Hurts plays on the soundtrack. I kind of loved the absurdity of that. I... I... (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I get what you're saying. I just thought it was too on the nose. I didn't need to intercut it with his mom on the stripper pole. Yeah, that was uh, (laughs) a treat for uh, Rob to see his wife looking good on screen. Which is pretty much every Rob Zombie movie ever made. Pretty much. On some level. I think she's been in pretty much all of his movies, and usually it's a pretty large part. Well, she's the lead in Lords of Salem. Yeah. But no, I really don't have a problem with the movie on a technical level. It's like there's little moments I can quibble here and there. I don't have a problem with how it's put together. Again, it's more just content. It's more just the approach approach, taste levels. That's more what keeps getting in the way. And Mm -hmm. honestly, like Sherry Moon Zombie, I actually really liked her as Michael's mom. Yeah, she was the whole shouting single mother in the opening, you know, tearing into her abusive boyfriend. And I don't like that scene, but I thought her performance was good. I thought she still showed a lot of love for her children. Oh, yeah. And I think when we see her at the asylum. Yeah. Still trying to hold to her child, even though he basically wiped out the entire rest of her family. Yeah. I think she does a really good job of showing the conflicting emotion in that. Yeah. There is a part of her that wants to tell him it's going to be okay. And there's a part of her that completely doesn't know like what her son has become. And is just kind of horrified by that. Yeah. And she's gone to not only accepting that he has this 
monster inside of him, but still trying to connect with him even as he grows increasingly distant. Mm -hmm. And it's not until, yeah, she sees him kill the nurse and takes off his mask and the rage just explodes out of him. Once she sees that side of him, because she never saw that, she saw the consequences of it, but she never actually saw that side until that day. Yeah. I like her character. I like the performance. I don't have any problems with her. What's interesting about the suicide scene, perfectly fine scene, but in the original treatment, when he gets to Haddonfield, the first place he goes is a trailer park where his mom is sitting there with a shotgun saying, I heard you were out. Yeah. And then she says you'll never find her before she blows her head off in front of him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't love it. I don't hate it. I think the way they did it is better. Because again, it's playing off the emotions of what she's lost, what she brought into this world. All these feelings of, did I do something wrong? What led to my child becoming this thing that I have now seen? Mm -hmm. I thought that was actually a very effective way to build that arc. And then it makes sense that then that would be how Laurie ended up entering the adoption system. Yeah. What do you think about Malcolm McDowell as Loomis? I really like Malcolm McDowell. If you're going to have somebody who's going to have the charisma of a Donald Pleasance, I think Malcolm McDowell, he's got that weight to him. He's got that respectability, but just a hint of madness to him as well. He's not doing Donald Pleasance at all. No. He's making the role his own. I think it works really well. And in fact, I actually think if you're going to do half this movie as a prequel, the movie should have been more about his focal point and where we mostly see it from Michael's side. I would have really enjoyed more time with Loomis as he gets frustrated and talks about how I've known you now for 15 years. That's twice as long as my first marriage. I would have loved to have seen him going home and just frustrated and like yelling at his wife because he can't reach Michael. Some of that was actually in the treatment. See, I, I think that would have been really good. I think that would have really made for a better film where instead of remaking the original and not doing it as well, exploring the cracks between the story of the original. Yeah. I thought his performance was great because there's an arrogant quality to his character, but there's also a lot of compassion. Yeah. He has ego, but I think he genuinely cares about Michael. He genuinely wants to help Michael, and he's genuinely troubled and broken by the fact that he can't. Right. I love the line when he's talking to Sid Haig in the graveyard where he's like, the psychiatrist there, he wrote a book about Michael, and he's like, yeah, I've read that. It's great. You know, it's... Yeah. <laughs> I love his sense of humor and everything, but at the same time, he does care about Michael. He really does feel like he failed him. Yeah. And yes, he wrote this book about Michael, but I think that was kind of like a mixed thing. On the one hand, yes, it funded his retirement. On the other, I think it was a way for him to genuinely pour out his frustrations with a patient he was never able to help. Mm -hmm. And again, the fact that he would come back and go through all that he goes through in trying to get Michael to stop I think he is genuinely invested in everything that is happening. And I think he feels every death that Michael is causing is because he wasn't able to help Michael. Yeah. I think I like him better in the first half where he's developing a relationship with Michael and then he gets frustrated by the lack of, you know... Michael was retreating behind the masks and everything. Right. When he becomes the guy just hunting Michael, he's still good. He still adds a lot to the film. I think scenes are a highlight of that second half, but he feels more rote by that point. I kind of disagree because what I like is that he still has this drive to help Michael, even though he is fully aware of the danger of Michael and what Michael is capable of. Like, that's why he's going and getting the Magnum. That's why he's trying to warn everyone about what's being... Being unleashed, even as he's still trying to appeal to Michael. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want Michael to die, even though he knows Michael's probably going to have to die. Right. It's like someone who has a beloved animal that they've trained for years that goes on the loose and is killing people. And it's like, you might have to put that down. You don't want to. You might try to do whatever you can to not. Yeah. But it's probably going to come to a case where that's necessary. And like when he ends up shooting him in the pool, you could tell like it's paining him to actually, you know, because he still sees the kid that he knew 15 20 years ago yeah. he also knows like this is a dangerous animal like he's going to kill this young girl if he doesn't do something yeah mcdowell is one of those actors who really should get way better roles than he does he tends to do a lot of schlock like this he collects a lot of paychecks yeah I remember he said that he didn't get along well with Kubrick. And so like after he did Clockwork Orange, that hurt his career a lot. Yeah, because Barry Lyndon was initially set up to also star him, which was Kubrick's next film. And, and yeah, then they had a big falling out. Yeah. And so I feel like he really is a really great actor. And I always love him in anything he's in. Like you said, he does a lot of paycheck films. But I do think he added a lot to this film. 
I appreciate a lot more of the second half of the film because of him. I mean, he's also an asshole. Oh, yeah. He's a very acerbic guy, a very sharp temper, who you kind of need to know how to work with in order to work well with him. So there's a lot of people who don't. That's actually one of the funnest things about the gag reel. There's a blooper reel for this, where a large part of it is just him and Brad Dorff riffing off of each other. And just <laughs> like Brad Dorff taking on a Monty Python British accent and then making up silly words all about penises. But there's other times where it's like he's obviously visually frustrated and is like causing other people to blow takes and he's being a cantankerous asshole and yet everyone's laughing and having a fun time. I think he's one of those, if you know how to work with him, you can get really good stuff out of him. If you don't mm -hmm. know how to work with him, you're either going to have a hellish time where he's not going to give much of a performance. Yeah, I can believe that. And no, this is one of those things where I think he really clicks. It was a good reconception of the character. While I do like the original Van Helsing angle of Loomis, where from very early on, Loomis just kind of gave up on Michael and was just all about, he's evil. Right. I say that as a joke, but that was literally the running theme of him, of declaring Michael as this evil soulless thing that needs to be locked and hidden away. Mm -hmm. There was never any chance that he was there. I mean, even when he was trying to help Jamie in like part five, he's constantly like yelling about how you've been cursed by the evil. You know, granted, he was an alcoholic at the time, but yeah. there was a one-noteness to Loomis's character, even even though I think the first film balanced it out with these nice little human moments like dialogue between him and the sheriff, scenes where like he's chasing away the kids who are trying to break into the boogeyman house. There is a humanity that he cares about the people being affected. But what I like about this one is it's the struggle between caring about the people being affected by Michael and caring about Michael. Right. They never quite figured out how to land that in the climax. Because again, you have that whole bit where he goes appeals to Michael and Michael like crushes his head. But then it's like, oh, but he's still alive. Yeah, you see him move a couple times after he's fallen, which I know he's in the sequel. So Well, and there is also an even earlier ending that they then replaced with the entire sequence where he's chasing Laurie through the house was a reshoot. Mm -hmm. The original ending was, you know, that bit where they have their face off and Michael is holding Laurie and Loomis is like, no, don't hurt her. She's innocent and all this. Yeah. That originally happened outside in front of the house. And as Michael is starting to lower the knife and let it go, that's when Sheriff Brackett and all the other cops show up. And it ultimately leads to Michael going down in a hail of bullets. Hmm. So you didn't have any of that other stuff with Laurie. On the one hand, I like things that this ending does, and I'll tell you the rest of it here in a sec. But I kind of like that we gave Laurie some more moments. So, and then what this ending does is then we have the shot of the bullet-ridden Michael Myers laying on the ground as the camera starts pulling up away from him. And you hear the audio of that first recorded meeting between Michael and Dr. Loomis. Hmm. The dialogue of the boy who became the monster over the image of the monster's final fate. I can kind of see like that might work a little better in some ways, just because for one thing, I do think the ending goes along a little bit too long. Like they did the original film, like, is that the boogeyman? I think it might be or whatever. And then you get Michael grabbing her again. That really felt long. Like it felt like it really needed to end earlier. So I think if you could cut that down a little bit, but I think Michael dying by a hail of bullets from cops, that doesn't feel right either. But again, that's something we've already seen Jason Voorhees do repeatedly. Yeah. They've even opened up movies with Jason Voorhees supposedly dying at a hail of bullets from cops. Right, right. This again gets to the frustrating construction of this film where that works as an ending for the Loomis-Michael relationship. Mm -hmm. The problem is they never fully transition over the main protagonist from being Loomis to being Laurie. Lori never really gets enough room to develop herself as the protagonist of her story. She's just a person who gets caught up in the story of Michael and Loomis. Yeah. There was so much focus on her in the original film that it's like she has her life and then these other forces invade it. In this one, we're spending so much time following those forces that instead she is the victim that they then set upon. Right. And I understand then in order to try to boost that, they expanded the climax to more prominently feature her. And there are aspects that I think they did well on that. But again, they never let it become her story. No. I really do think that Lori does feel like she's been done a disservice in this. Not greatly. I do think the actress does really well. Mm -hmm. I kind of like some of the updating. Well, Rob didn't have a Deborah Hill to help him write Teenage Girls. <laughs> right. But I do, at the same time, it feels like maybe not more realistic, but it does feel more modern, I guess. It feels modern, but it still feels very much written by a guy. Yeah. Like the whole bagel thing, like maybe some girls might do something like that, but I don't know how common that would be, doing that in front of your mom. Whatever. 
I do think that she felt a little bit more updated. She doesn't feel like a character. And admittedly, like, I can't really tell you a whole lot about the original Laurie Strode, but she felt like we got to know her because we spent so much time with her. Yeah. After Michael gets out of the asylum and gets his mask, it's like maybe 15 minutes later, she's babysitting. Basically, the last act of the film is essentially starting. I think one of the misconceptions is to miss Peg, the original Laurie, as the shy bookworm. She was, again, a very intelligent and aware person, but, you know, she had friendships. She was social. She was cautious. She was a bit more introverted and she was cautious. Mm -hmm. But I think that was because she was played as someone who more thinks about the consequences of things and that kind of wards her away from taking. She wasn't a risk taker. Right. Her friends were risk takers. She wasn't a risk taker. She was someone who put a lot of thought up into her education, her future, saving up money, babysitting kids and all that stuff. That's where, you know, there's the whole Lori being a virgin and that's why she wasn't killed. No, it's because she had different priorities. Right. She had a crush on a boy. Her friends were trying to set her up. She had friends. But sex and relationships just wasn't her priority. Her education was. Mm -hmm. She was a very realized character in that regard. In the way a lot of John Carpenter's early characters were very well realized characters, even if they didn't announce all of their traits. They had very subtle definitions. Right. And again, the reason why she was their survivor was because she was the one who paid attention. She was the one who was always worrying about things, so she would see the shadow around the corner, whereas her other friends were so distracted by other things. Yeah. There's nothing like that here. And to be fair, there's no requirement that he makes this Lori the same character. I think, though, they're trying too hard to run counter to that. Okay, you're going to make a winking sex joke in front of your mom? Go for it. But again, it's just they play it out too long. Yeah. You know, the bit where her and Annie are pretending to have sex in front of the kids. Okay, but they play it out too long. And also, they spend so much focus on a lot of the quippiness that there's not enough character building. And it's not mm -hmm. just even Lori, but it's Lori and the other girls. You don't get that definition of character. You don't really get that much delineation between them either. No. To be honest, like the three girls, if it wasn't for the fact that one of them is Danielle Harris, now playing a 29-year-old, 19-year-old. To be fair, she still looks like she's 15. Oh, yeah. She looks the same age as the other girls. I don't know how old uh, Linda was, but I'm pretty sure Scout Taylor Compton as Lori was 19 at the time. So this was 11 years ago. Christina Cleave would have been 28. Scout Taylor Compton was born in 89, so she actually was only 18. Okay. So yeah, she looks like a teenager. But the, honestly, the other two, even though they're older, they're believable as teenagers. And I do think it was kind of a nice little touch to bring in Danielle Harris. I'm surprised that she's the only actress from the original franchise to be brought in that I, at least I'm aware of. They're just not interesting characters, the three girls no. in this one. It's not that they're bad. Their performances are fine. I think Rob Zombie's writing gets more crap than it deserves. Yeah, there's times where, again, he doesn't know how to rein in his more wilder aspects. Mm -hmm. And there are times where a line can just come off as just really unnatural. And there's times when the dialogue is really nice and flows really well. He's just not a very polished writer, which, again, that's not a bad thing in itself, because that can actually add a lot of personality to writing. What's fascinating about John is John can actually write women really well, even without Deborah Hill, but Deborah Hill added that very natural aspect to those three girls that we don't get here. Right. We don't spend enough time in the movie with them. So much of the movie is overtaken by the backstory of Michael and Loomis that we just don't get the time to really settle into them and their lives as characters and as people. And we never really get enough of a hook to care. Right. Like I said, they squeeze the entire original film into the last act of this film, which is admittedly is the last hour of it. You feel that pressure because there's just not enough room to let these characters feel fleshed out at all. I mean, actually, what really gravitated me towards Laurie is I actually really liked the interactions between her and Tommy. Yeah. I thought they played those two off each other really well. And the actor playing Tommy was actually really good. He was a child actor I saw in a lot of stuff back then. Even then when Lindsay comes in, I thought she, she was fun. Yeah, she was really good too. Like, she doesn't get as much to do as Tommy. And I like him, like, oh, I don't like girls, but they're obviously friendly. If not, you know, the girls are hinting that they're going to fall in love at some point or something like that. It felt like those kids actually had a little bit more personality than I think a lot of the other characters that had bigger roles. I can't remember what did I know him from. The Bill Engvall show. He was the son, yeah. Okay. And he was on Psych. Oh, he played young Sean on Psych oh, for the first okay. three seasons. Yeah, I like that kid. I don't hate what's here. I just don't like that it's not fully gelling. And again, to get into that climax, I do think it is overly drawn out with Laurie gets away and then she gets caught and then gets away and then gets caught and then gets away and then gets caught. I like the scene where she's in the ceiling and I like the scene where she's hiding in the wall, but I would have picked one instead of having both. Yeah. But even then, I like Laurie at the very end 
where she falls through the ceiling and she stands up and she's just covered in blood. She's all dazed. She's had the crap taken out of her. What I like about this Lori is that while she's a very hysterical person in terms of, you know, she's still just caught. She just saw her friends get slaughtered. She's being chased by this merciless killer who just killed these cops in front of her. She's very much filled with emotion Mm -hmm. that she is struggling to keep in as she's trying to hide. What I like is that she never stops reacting and she never stops moving. Yeah. She never stops trying to find a way out of each situation. And even though it leads her to a new situation, she still keeps moving. And even as she's standing there just dazed and bloodied and Michael is in the doorway, she still pulls up that gun. She's still fighting. And I actually really like how they end this movie with the variation of him going off the window with they both go out the window. And she's just sitting there straddling this unconscious, potentially dead Michael Myers. And she's got the revolver and she's just clicking through empty chamber after empty chamber until he grabs her arm. And that's when that bullet goes off and she's just splashed with blood and is screaming. And it's again, it's a very garish image, but it's an effective one. Yeah, it definitely is one of those things that if you stop and think about that is truly horrific to have to experience that. I'm used to horror films where they usually give you a little bit more closure than that. But I got to admit, like, as far as like making me go, oh, shit, that is a hell of an ending. It is a very 70s grindhouse ending because, you know, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the bleeding woman screaming in the back of the truck. It's very much of that sensibility. Right. And, you know, he's obviously a big 70s grindhouse person. That's one of those bits where I don't mind him bringing that sensibility to this. I think that was actually a very effective moment. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just do that whole thing of like... When we got to the pool, I actually forgot how this movie ended. So when we got to the pool, I'm like, oh, are they going to leave him in the pool and then turn around and he's gone and then that's the end? That wouldn't work on this movie. Trying to recreate that original ending wouldn't work on this movie. No. I think her clicking through the gun and then the one shot finally going off was effective enough of a punch that is it a recreation of the Halloween ending? No, it is a brand new ending, but it's an effective ending and I'm fine with it. No, I didn't mind the ending at all. And again, then flashes over the credits of the old home movie footage I thought was actually very effective too. Yeah. Especially when he's like out the bat and he's beating that toy animal on the ground, which unfortunately it took me like a few shots before I'm like, oh, oh, please don't be a real animal. <laughs> But yeah, showing again both the warmth and brutality of young Michael. I kind of in a way of we should talk about the rape. We probably should just because it does stand oh, out quite a lot. I will be curious to see how they, it, you said that it's the, one of the major changes they made in the theatrical version. So I know when the film came out in theaters, within a week of the film coming out, the work print leaked. And that was one of the big scenes that was talked about because it wasn't in the theatrical cut. I don't understand why it's here. What does it add to the story to have these two redneck guys working at the asylum drag a woman into Michael's room, both rape her in front of them? It's like not even try to. They rape her fully in front of them. And then he kills them both. It's weird because it takes him so long to get up and do anything. And I get like he's not there to save the girl. At least he didn't kill the girl in this guy. I was expecting that he would kill the rapist and then kill the girl. I remembered it as him killing the girl. And I'm glad that he doesn't in that version. It's just weird that, especially with this version of Michael, who, like you said, he's a lot more of a brute. He's got a lot more rage. There's absolutely ways that you set up this one orderly as an antagonist. There's absolutely ways you could have had that lead to Michael getting free. Yeah. The orderly is already antagonizing him and making fun of his masks. And it's not even that orderly who's the one who goes to break in. It's that orderly's cousin who now works at the asylum who then broke the old orderly in. Yeah. That's already convolutions upon convolutions that you don't need. It's unpleasant and it doesn't add anything other than just unpleasantness. If you want to make it show like how messed up the situation is, you wait until he kills Danny Trejo because that shows like all that youthful innocence that we saw, that is completely gone now. That I thought was really effective. But to have the rape in front of that, it's just there for excess. It's just there to make you feel unpleasant and upset. And they're doing it to a woman who has no other part in the story. She is literally just there to be raped. Uh, I believe on IMDb, it says she's uncredited. Maybe she decided that she didn't want to be credited. Well, also, those credits would have been for the theatrical cut and if she didn't appear in it. That's true. Yeah, that is one thing I would absolutely would have taken out long before it was filmed. This is the type of thing that has kept me from looking at Rob Zombie's other movies is I don't want to watch another scene like that. Was this the scene that you were talking about when you said you read the original script and the treatment? No, that's actually a scene that's even worse. Oh. I'll get to that in a second. But it's these taste levels that, you know, again, it's like Rob Zombie's under no obligation to have my same taste and aesthetics. 
But again, it's like, if you're going to have orderlies raping a woman in an asylum, first of all, why? Yeah. Okay, this is where we get into the thorny topic in terms of what is allowed in storytelling. Everything is allowed in storytelling. Everything. You can have rape in storytelling. You can have molestation. You can have assaults. But you do still have a responsibility in terms of how you do it and why you're doing it. And people are allowed to not be interested in it and they're allowed to criticize the hell out of it. But you still, if you're going to do this, you need to ask yourself, how are you doing this and why? And I think this fails both of those questions because why? No reason. There's no reason for it at all. No. If you want to get into how these orderly abuses are sliding by in the system, then focus on how they abuse Michael. Have it actually play out that this entire escape happens because of a lack of regulatory oversight on the people who work there. And that shit that's now coming down on the cameo by Udo Kier and Clint Howard, who are there, <laughs> but they never again comment on the fact that this all happened because two of your orderlies decided to rape a woman. Right. There's no consequence. We never find out what happens to the woman. It's never brought up again that this entire incident happens because these two redneck orderlies raped a woman. Quentin Tarantino did almost the exact same scene in Kill Bill. But it was focused on the character, and it was still unnecessary. I mean, you could have done it a different way, obviously. And I mean, any story, there's a number of ways you could do any scene. But I do think that works better for me in Kill Bill because... Yes. No, I agree with that. Because the bride is given agency because she's able to get revenge on both Buck and the guy who is about to rape her. Well, also the film airs the threat of it. It doesn't play it out. This one, they're not portraying us with the threat that they're going to rape this woman. No, we actually see both of them right. perform the actual act over minutes. The inmate is not given any character, does nothing but scream. She's just there as a victim mm -hmm. because Rob Zombie knows that it's going to make us all feel uncomfortable. And that's fine, but that is something that's very upsetting for a lot of people. Well, for provocateurs, that alone is the reason that motivates them to do it. Yeah. But again, it's like, what is this adding to the overall thing? Nothing. And how are you executing it? poorly because you're not actually playing out that that would actually be a rather significant incident to happen in this story if that act itself led to this entire situation. You're having this thing happen and then you're just ignoring that it happened. Mm -hmm. That's poor storytelling. Yeah. Even then, the sexualization of pretty much every young woman in this movie. Yeah. Because you not only have her, you had Judith had a topless sex scene. Linda has a fully nude sex scene. Daniel Harris has not only a topless sex scene, but then spends her entire assault being topless. Yeah. I always go back to like Cabin in the Woods where the blonde cheerleader girl is topless. And then when the violence is about to happen, she immediately covers up. And they actually make a point of that where they try to say like the violence and the sex are separate because we're not trying to sexualize the violence. This runs that line. Right. Well, I mean, especially when he's like strangling the new Linda. And again, especially that scene with Annie. Again, there are parts of that sequence that I think are really damned effective. Like the part where Michael is just playing with the corpse of her dead boyfriend while she's screaming Lori's name. She's like stripped naked, covered in blood, can't walk because I think something's been broken. She's just screaming, Lori! Lori! Because Lori had gone into the other room to call, doesn't even know Michael is there. Mm -hmm. Is just such on the peak of emotion. And then I also like the punch that Michael doesn't kill Annie. Yeah. And not only does he not kill Annie, but then Sheriff Brackett has to come and see his daughter in this state. Which is just, oh my god, imagine as a parent seeing that. Yeah, no, it's fucked up. I don't actually have a problem with that aspect of it. But again, just the way they drag out the attack. Again, something gets broken in her. She's dragging herself across the floor, topless and everything, blood all over. And it's just, they do linger in a way that is very exploitative, I feel. Yeah. And again, Linda does have some degree of agency in terms of the way she's dealing with her boyfriend. She's someone who doesn't have a problem with being naked. But I don't really think the scene with the whole ghost sheet is very well. It's very clumsy in its execution. That's another problem with having Tyler Maine as your antagonist. Yeah, you're going to notice the height change. Yeah. So he's kind of hunching over over, which just makes them all wide. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> I do kind of like that Bob, the boyfriend, actually put on the ghost sheet to do that joke himself, and then right. Michael just yanks him. That was a nice twist. Yeah, I, I didn't mind that at all. All the boyfriends in this movie were like all the same scuzzy, long-haired 70s guys. Yeah. Every single one. But what's weird is that there's this mix of the sex and the violence, and yet they kind of toy with the idea of Michael having this kind of misogynistic mix of viewing women through sex and violence. 
And yet they never really follow. I mean, it's like Stephen Hutchinson absolutely dug deep into that in his comics. Mm-hmm. But I don't think Rob ever really digs into that. And the fact is also that Michael kills just as many dudes throughout this as he does the women. It's just the women all happen to be naked at the time. The dudes don't. Right. They kind of toy with that of, you know, Michael having the conflicted feelings over seeing the ad of his mother as a stripper. There's that moment where he comes up on his sister in the room and he's running his fingers along her leg. They kind of seem to be leaning in that direction, but they never go fully all in, which to be fair, I'm fine with because that was also one of the aspects of Stephen Hutchinson that I thought went a little too overboard and also tried to find a rationale to Michael that almost made so much sense that it was less interesting. Yeah. And to be honest, it goes back to your comparison to Friday the 13th, because I think wanting to punish people for having sex is much more of a Jason personality trait. Michael, there is that thing with his sister, but for the most part, he would just attack just about anyone. Yeah, it didn't really feel like it was motivated by anything. Right. It almost feels like he was targeting the kids because the fact that they all were having sex, at least Annie and Linda, that feels like a deliberate choice. Yeah, it feels exploitive and gross. Well, Annie even wasn't in a sexual act in the original film, too. You know, she was in Right, a car. that's what I was saying. It's, that was a choice by Rob Zombie to make it. I mean, we had the butter spill, but... <laughs> yeah. And that, again, I think it's him trying to dive more into the 70s grindhouse, I think. And again, that's Halloween and Friday the 13th are very different things. I think the problem of the Halloween sequels are when they tried to be more Friday the 13th and didn't realize that there is a different sensibility to both of them that makes them distinct. And again, this is falling into that same trap of thinking, oh, the mass killer thing is it's kind of the same. They all follow the same tropes. No, Halloween does not follow the same tropes. It just doesn't. No. So anyways, we are getting into the brutality, the sexualization. So that scene that was deleted from the script. Mm-hmm. So remember the scene where you know he lures the bully into the woods and beats Seddon with a stick? Yeah. Which again, very effective sequence. It was kind of funny seeing that it's the kid from the Spy Kids movies. Oh, was it? Okay. Originally, it was this girl who was never developed as a character. She was just this girl that we would see Michael eye at school and start to follow around. And he lures her into the woods, clonks her on the head with a shovel so that she falls into a pit that he's already dug. Then he urinates on her. The fuck? And then he starts burying her while she's still writhing on the ground. Ugh. So I don't even know how more extreme any of the other things were in the original script, because I never made it past that scene. Yeah, I could see why. And that scene, again, was like on page 20, because that was his first kill. I feel sick just hearing that. And especially since, at least in this version, Michael was like maybe in middle school. Yeah. What does it contribute to Michael Myers as a character that he's pissing on her? Yeah, and that's never been anything like any version of Michael. I can barely even understand it as an exploration of the misogyny of Michael, but even the Stephen Hutchison Michael, which was all like pure misogyny, even he wouldn't just stand there and like drop his fly and piss on a woman after killing her. No. And that's where I'm like, does he do that again later in the story? Is this set up something i don't even know and i don't want to no again i even did dig out that script for prep for this episode and i just sat there looking at it and i'm like no i don't want to do this oh hey that's right i have the treatment it's only 30 pages <laughs> and what's interesting about that treatment is there's part of me that's curious about seeing that original script but that treatment after you get through the prologue stuff mm-hmm. he's basically then just transcribing the original film hmm. and he spills butter you know gets killed in the car Basically, like, beat for beat, here's what happened in the original film. It just had an extended prologue. Huh. So that's kind of where part of me has a morbid curiosity of what were the other stages of him developing the story into this different direction that he went. But I don't really have the interest in reading that. Life is too short. <laughs> let's, let's, just, let's not read that. Yeah. And again, that was a script that leaked while the film was still in production. And Rob was like, we changed things. Don't worry. Because people flipped out when they read that scripture. were just like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, I could totally see why people would be like completely freaking out about that and deservedly so. Is there anything else that you can think of? Just any like little moments or characters or technical things? I liked a lot of the cameos. Yeah. You got Clint Howard and Udo Kier. Richard Lynch is the principal. Yeah. Mickey Dolan's. What's his name from Dawn of the Dead? Oh, yeah, Big yeah, Joe Grizzly. Yeah. Uh, Ken Foray. Who, <laughs> funny, because I know him as the dad on Keenan and Kel. <laughs> <laughs> That's like one of the scenes I remember the most when I watched it the first time was like, I really liked his scene. Who can have a jumpsuit that'll fit Tyler Maine? Yeah. 
you know, I mean, he's on the screen for like maybe two minutes, but he's pretty yeah. memorable. Like he feels like a fleshed out character. He yeah. would probably be in another film, be the star, like in a black exploitation film. I want that film. Yeah. And that's again where I don't have a problem with even the small parts he fleshes out. He gives mm-hmm. them some personality, some meat, adds some color to the character. You're just something that makes those two minutes that they're going to be on screen or two minutes that you're going to remember. Yeah. That's something I actually really like in storytelling in general. No small parts. Even Brad Dorif, this version of Sheriff Brackett wasn't really given a whole lot to do. To be fair, a lot of that's in the cutscenes, too. And the original version didn't have a whole lot yeah. either. I mean, he was just an authority figure that was there to take Loomis around. Yeah, I mean, that scene with him and Annie, like when he discovers her body, like that is really haunting. And I think he does a really good job. Like he said, he fills it up with a lot of really great... I mean, Danny Trejo, like I already discussed him, but I really like his scene. Yeah. You really care about this janitor who's, again, on screen for maybe three minutes. He sees this kid locked in a cell and is just kind of like, hey kid, I know what it's like to be locked in. You know, you just got to get in your head and you hang in there, stay tough. You know, he's kind and is trying to comfort this kid, but he almost gives that kid the wrong advice yeah. because of arm of Michael is he gets so locked inside his head. Exactly. But even just that scene where he sees Michael having killed all these people and he's like, Michael, I I got to take you back to your room. And he's like trying to get the cuffs on Michael. It's so sad. He's like, yeah, I cared for you. And as his head's getting slammed into the water over and over again and drowning. It's like the Loomis thing of he cares for the character, but he also understands the consequences of letting this character be free. Right. God, if only he had stuck around and like him and Loomis are running around together. <laughs> the doctor and the janitor. He wasn't a janitor. He was an orderly. I thought he was mopping the first time we see him, but I may be wrong. Well, orderlies mop too. You actually have to be specially trained in order to work in facilities like that in general. Yeah, fair enough. I don't mind that impulse. I even just love that one brief moment we get of the manager of the strip club, who I know had a full scene in the uh, deleted scenes. And it's like, if you're going to have someone just be on camera for one shot, at least make it a memorable shot. Mm -hmm. Even just like the bit with the school bully where he grabs the hat from the kid walking by. Yeah. (laughs) And that was a scene where you see like as he's walking to the woods, you see Michael watching him in Mm -hmm. the foreground. A very John Carpenter-esque shot. Yeah. There are flashes here and there that I really do enjoy. Yeah. It's just that overall, the package doesn't quite come together. We still have the other cut to check out. So here's my question. So 11 minutes were cut out of this movie. What would you cut? The rape is obvious. Yeah. So that's seven minutes. Really? It felt like it. I think you could <laughs> tighten up the fight with Lori and Michael at the end. The ceiling are in her in the wall. Like, you need to get rid Pick of at one. least one of those. Yeah. So other stuff you could tighten up here and there, like Danny Trejo's death. Yeah, I think that probably does go on a little bit too long. You could just cut off of his screaming face in the water. Yeah. You don't have to have him be pulled out and then go back in. And then pulled out and then go back in. And then thrown to the floor. And then Michael wrenches the TV off the wall and then hits him with the TV. And it's just like, it goes on forever. Save those moments for the deaths we really want to revel in. Yeah, because that's one where you like that character. You don't want to see him suffer so much. And yeah, it's there to show like how uncompassionate Michael is at this point. But you don't really need that much to get that idea. I would re-edit the love hurt scene. I don't mind that we see the mom as a stripper. That's part of her life. That's part of the conflict and identity that she has with Michael. But that scene goes on too long. I think you could take out a lot with Ronnie, the mom's boyfriend. Yeah, tighten that up. You have everything you need in there, plus more. There's a lot of this movie that you could just tighten up. Yeah. William Forsyth does a good job with that role, but you understand that character instantly. Like, you don't need as much of him calling him all these terrible names. Like, by the end of that first scene with him and the mom yelling at each other, you know everything you need to know about him. You could have Michael stab him right then and there, and no one would blink. Again, this is where I think Rob doesn't know how to rein himself in, because, yeah, you have five different moments. You only need one. You're not even doing like set up, set up punchline because it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're just doing repetition. Yeah, you could absolutely chop stuff like that down. Why do we even have the graveyard scene in this one, given how barely featured the gravestone is? Yes, Lori wakes up to find the naked corpse of Linda laying in front of the gravestone. But directorially, they never highlight the gravestone. No. The focus is all on Linda. By the time I see the gravestone, I've forgotten that, you know, that gets mentioned like twice in the whole film. It's so barely there, you can cut around it. You don't even need yeah. the setup for it. I mean, I think the reason why that's in the movie is because it has Sid Haig in it, and Sid Haig is a friend of Rob Zombie, so. It's stuff like that. Stuff could have been just tightened up. Like, you know, the attack on Annie. 
there's genuine good punch there. You could just tighten up the build up to it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to see all the boyfriends die. Well, granted, if you kick out the deaths of the boyfriends, then it is focusing more on the deaths on the women. So I understand that for a balancing out purpose. Yeah, I don't know. Those are the tricky bits where you'd have to really sit down and evaluate it. But again, there's just a lot of scenes where like the beating up the bully, you can tighten that up. You still have all the punch that you have in there. You just tighten it up. But I've learned from podcast editing, you've seen my logs. Mm -hmm. I'm currently working on a show that you and I did together where the rough cut was two hours and five minutes, and I've currently brought it down to 88 minutes. Right. And that's just from taking out little things here and there. Editing brings things down if you just do a lot of little stuff. Again, I think the problem is that you have two movies here. You have a prequel yes. movie that, given more time and just taking out the whole remake aspect of it, you get fleshed out some of the characters more, have Loomis be more of a central figure. Either do that story or you do Laurie's story. Right. You can't do both. They're not successfully doing both. As it works, it doesn't. It's too crowded. You basically have two incomplete movies at odds with each other. Would you even play with it by like breaking up that prologue and kind of doing like nonlinear, kind of almost a Nolan-esque playing out the present and the past simultaneously? I think you could do it. I mean, I don't think you could do it with this version. Yeah. But I think there is a way you could have told that story that way. Like if they were afraid of doing a prequel story without Michael Myers in the mask, they could have just done a regular sequel. Yeah, you can explore the backstory while still moving forward. Yeah, and just told the next chapter instead of having to do a remake. I think that's my biggest problem with this film is the remake part of it, it doesn't work as well as Carpenter. I'm okay with having someone having a different vision than Carpenter, but the problem is that even if you take that aside, it doesn't work. Parts of it work. I mean, we liked a lot of the cast. We liked a lot of moments here and there. But mm -hmm. the remake aspect of it just isn't as solid. There's not a lot there other than just hitting the same beats in different ways and not really adding anything new to it. I like 70% of this movie. 70% of this movie, I don't love it, but I'm fine with it. I think there is, again, some good execution. There's never a point where I'm like fully pulled into this movie, but I'm fine with it. The problem is that the other 30% is stuff that I dislike to such a degree that it does bring everything else down. Mm -hmm. My not recommend isn't as vehement as it was years and years ago when I started podcasting. God, it's been a long time. 2011 <laughs> was when we did that. Way back in the day. Oh my goodness. My aching sciatica. Oh. Those aspects are, again, you know, very intrinsic of Rob Zombie, who has a very specific aesthetic that I don't think fits the sensibilities of Halloween when Halloween is at its best. And the most frustrating thing is, if you look at films like Halloween Resurrection, a lot of those were just paycheck films. Nobody there had any yeah. passion for it. Rob Zombie has a lot of passion for this film. The problem oh, yeah. is, it's completely misplaced in the wrong spots. The parts that he really wants to explore and flesh out and do more with are the parts that really didn't need to be explored yeah. and fleshed out. It's like if you take a beautiful painter and have them try to play a piano sonata. Yeah. They're beautiful in their use of color and landscapes, but they can't play a piano. Again, his horror films don't interest me, but he has his aesthetic. He has a style. He's had success at that. I don't begrudge him that. I'm not saying he's a bad filmmaker at all. Again, it just keep going back to Friday the 13th because this keeps falling into that trap where people keep lumping Halloween and Friday the 13th together when there's a lot of very significant difference between the two. And the Halloween sequels keep trying to become Friday the 13th while losing what made them Halloween. Mm -hmm. You know, and this just keeps falling into that same trap. And that's the frustrating thing for me is because it's not that I see this as an uninteresting film, but I feel it is misunderstanding the thing that it is trying to create an explanation for. Mm -hmm. It's like it's trying to solve the mysteries of the universe and they come up with this really great explanation for cotton candy. <laughs> it makes some really tasty cotton candy, but what about those mysteries of the universe? Yeah. It's not that I think it's a bad movie. There's a handful of things in it that I think are legitimately bad and awful and should have been removed. But the majority of the film is not a bad movie. It's just a misjudged movie. Yeah, I agree. There is a lot of potential here for a lot better movie. I think if you had divorced it from the Halloween franchise and let him create his own little story where it's about a kid circling the drain of life and just retreating into this darkness, I think you could have told like a really cool story. It may not have been one of my favorites in the world or anything, but I think it could have been a better film than this half Halloween, half Jason Voorhees, 
half something else entirely. It's half hillbilly deluxe. Yeah. It's a weird mismatch of properties, and you wind up with too many parts that really don't quite work together. It hits the slasher movie tropes, but it doesn't hit the tropes that were intrinsic to Halloween. Right. It's not that it's a bad slasher movie. It's just, again, it's not a very effective Halloween movie. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we're going to cut off here. So we are going to be back. It's going to be a couple weeks for us, but we'll be back right after the edit, Mark. And we are going to take a look at the theatrical cut. And that's also where we're going to look at the actual release and reception of the movie, too. I'm genuinely curious because on the one hand, I do think Halloween 6 was improved by the theatrical cut. I'm curious to see if they can fix some of the issues I had here. But on the other hand, it's still the Weinstein Brothers. Yeah. Who even setting aside their troubled legacy, which we never should, they did not have a good reputation for their demands in terms of recutting material. Right. They kind of were notorious for it. And I know that some of the material that we were upset by is not going to be here, but it's not going to fix a lot of the structural flaws of this film. Well, that's where I'm going to be curious. Are they going to create more problems in tightening oh, yeah. it up, or are they actually going to make it smoother by tightening it up? I'll be curious to see how it pans out, but I have a feeling I'm not going to be won over by saying, oh, oh, wow, this is a much better version of the film. Halloween 6, we thought, was a much better version of the film. It just wasn't still a good film. Right. <laughs> Let's quantify that. But yeah, we'll be back here in just a second. Evil. I'm a much better actor than you, Donald. All right, everybody. Welcome back to our discussion of Rob Zombie's 2007 remake of Halloween. Uh, it's still Noel, still joined by JD. Hello. We just had our episode where we discussed the director's cut of Halloween, and now we've sat down and watched the theatrical cut of Halloween, and not a whole lot was changed. No. It's very much a nips and tucks here and there. There's, I want to say, a good handful of significant things that were changed. JD, does this cut alter your recommend or not recommend at all, or pretty much the same? No, there's one major scene that they changed that makes it a bit less offensive, hmm. but they also made it a little bit more ridiculous in other ways. <laughs> so I really don't think it really changes my opinion of the film overall. Because like you said, it is very much the same film. They dropped a line here. The scene may have been cut a little bit sooner there, but nothing that's really amazing or noteworthy yeah. except for like a few handful of things. It doesn't change my recommend. I will say what's odd is this is now my third time having seen the Rob Zombie film twice in the period of a month. I am starting to grow more of an appreciation for it with each time. Hmm. <laughs> we just had our discussion where we talked a lot about, you know, the differences between Michael and Jason and what are the things that we feel define Michael Myers as a character and as a portrayal. And what I'm kind of noticing in this one is that while it's not the classical portrayal of Michael that I typically enjoy... What I do like is they're doing a bit of a new reinterpretation of the blank face, the shape, the no man, where what I'm liking is how this killer is someone who becomes so detached, so disassociated from the world around him that he's just kind of wandering adrift through it. And the only way he can connect to it is through acts of violence. Mm -hmm. I'm appreciating that more. It still doesn't make me like the movie. It still doesn't like me love it as a Halloween movie. But I am at least appreciating that more as an interesting character study for a slasher film. See, I watched it, which again would be my third time, and I think I kind of like it a little bit less now. I don't know why. <laughs> I think part of it is, after our conversation last time, some of the incongruities with the established Halloween lore, and also just little things like, I can't tell you what any point in this film is supposed to be set at, because what was supposed to be 15 years ago, which would have been like 1990 when this film came out, that looks like the 70s so much. Rob Zombie clearly wants to make a 70s film, and yet it's nominally supposed to be set in 1990 or thereabout. I kind of like that anachronism because it allows the film to be a little more timeless. It doesn't work for me, but that's nitpicky stuff. I totally acknowledge yeah. that. But it's some of the performances just grate on me a little bit more. It's still Rob's writing. Yeah, it's the thing. This cut it does not change the fact that it's still pretty much the same film. It's just shorter, yeah. which is a little bit of a mercy, I think. I still don't particularly love it as a Halloween movie. Right. I still don't love it as a movie in general. I think it's still tasteless and garish. And by intention, it is a very ugly movie. But it's still just Rob's taste levels and mine just don't intermix. And that's not something I begrudge him for. It's just not a journey I can follow him along on. But even then, as its own movie, I'm starting to at least get a little bit more appreciation for it. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to list all of the little changes because pretty much every scene had little nips and tucks here and there. The film does move a lot snappier, a lot less lingering, 
lot of dialogue like when Loomis is with the groundskeeper at the graveyard and is like, I can't get a hold of the sheriff. Can I borrow your cell phone? No, I don't, I don't believe in those things. They give you brain cancer. You know, like they cut that out. Oh, yeah. Tommy's saying, you know, you wouldn't have had to make my peanut butter sandwich twice if you had done it right the first time. <laughs> Stuff like that. It's just little moments. There's two those type of moments that really stood out. And I don't know why, like Judith Myers calling eggs chicken abortions. Yes. Like, I don't know why that one's cut out of the theatrical. It tightened up the scene. And the one that really stuck with me, though, was the nurse. That's one of the big ones. Okay. Let's go ahead and bring that one up, because I think that one is a bit where they just removed one line, but it does very much change the feel of the scene. And that's where the nurse is left alone with Michael, sees the photo of him and, and young Laurie. And in the original cut said, cute baby, couldn't possibly be related to you which is what right. triggers his attack. And in this one, she just simply says, cute baby, and then turns away, and Michael still attacks her. It's interesting having watched the director's cut first, because the look on her face is smug. Yeah. I don't know how I would have read it not knowing that line was there, but it's still evident in the theatrical cut that she has this smug, I just put you in your place look on her face that doesn't really register with her just saying, oh, cute baby. It doesn't edit well together in my mind. It seems like you can see the edges more obviously. And again, I'm coming from a perspective of someone who saw the lengthier version. It does make Michael's attack seem more random. So I guess if you're trying to make him be a true psychopath rather than just somebody trying to get revenge against those who hurt him, it touches on that aspect, I guess. If that's something that you need to have addressed, I don't know if we really did. Yeah, I don't always like it when they feel like they need to demonize everyone that he's going to attack as though it's like giving him justification for why they'll attack certain people. And while we started the movie with that in terms of Ronnie and Judith, it is necessary to say that he's still willing to attack people for just no reason. Like his mom and his doctor just left. The two people mm -hmm. that he has any connection with, maybe that's why he chose to lash out. I kind of like that it raises a question of why her, why now? Or it could be that she just addressed the baby, which is something that Michael... Is so protective of. Yeah. I think, yes, you can still visibly see in her performance that there's this kind of spongus, but that could still just be read as, she's a nurse, she's been working the whole day, she's just been told to sit down with this kid, and she's just reading her newspaper. Yeah. It's kind of dismissive, but it's not confrontational like she was in the other one. True. And I kind of like that there's that added ambiguity, because again, it's like, why does Michael attack Judah's boyfriend? Mm -hmm. That boyfriend never really did anything to slight him. No. There's still all the questions of why does Michael ultimately decide to be as ferocious to Danny Trejo as he does? You don't really need that answer. It's because that person got in his way. Right. I like that Michael is willing to turn on it. I mean, like, even when he's screaming at his mom, he's turned on his mom, the one person he's connected with. Mm -hmm. There is that switch that once it flicks, Michael goes from just detached to this is my only outlet is destruction. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like I appreciate that on a character level. Yeah, I can see that. In this stretch of the movie is also where we have a lot of stuff cut out in terms of there were all these constant voiceovers of Loomis as he's doing his study of Michael actual like film footage that he was doing of Michael, a lot more of him explaining how he's seeing Michael retreat into the mass and his analysis of the mass and detaching from reality. And in this cut, you just kind of see it. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more of a montage as you just see this progression from them communicating to Michael now talking about secrets and wearing masks to even his mother getting frustrated that he won't take off the mask and is talking about his ugly. It's more just a kind of let's step back and just watch it happen. What do you think about that change? To be honest, I really didn't miss it. I really didn't notice the difference that much. I think both are close to being equally effective in demonstrating Michael becoming more and more detached and starting to yeah. fade away from the little boy that his mother remembers to being the Michael Myers that we all know. I think both scenes are fine as they are. I think it goes on a lot longer, noticeably longer in the director's cut mm -hmm. because of all that addition. But it's not that it's bad stuff that was lost. I think the scene still works just fine without it and it does roll quicker. And then probably the biggest change between the two movies is the way Michael breaks out. In the original cut, of course, was the two guards who break into his room to rape a woman. In this one, it's a group of guards who actually are tasked with transporting Michael out. And as they're transporting him is when he breaks loose and kills them all. So what did you think about that difference? That's kind of what I was referring to as far as being less offensive, but a little bit more ridiculous because, yes, they don't have the rape, which I am grateful for. It was gross and offensive and seemed to serve no purpose other than to be gross and offensive. This version doesn't have that, so I appreciate that. But at the same time, it has Michael break through solid chains. Yes. With no effort. Like he's Superman or Luke Cage or something. Like they've made him a full on superhero. There could have been a dozen different ways that they could have had him break out and you could still have him killing a whole bunch of people if that's what you need for your horror film. 
but I don't like Michael Myers to be that blatantly super powerful. And again, that's kind of reminding me of like Halloween 4 where it's like he's killing people by literally just grabbing their heads and tearing them open. Yeah. I was watching this scene. I'm just because I'd never seen this sequence before. And I'm just trying to figure out, well, how is he going to get out of this? He literally just snaps the chains. And it's like, really? I'm almost wondering if some of that was if Rob kind of maybe resented the fact that he was being forced to film an entirely new sequence for the movie and was just kind of like, ah, fuck it. And just half-assed it. Yeah, I could see that. I wondered the same thing, to be honest. I mean, we needed something different because that rape sequence was just so poorly done, misjudged. And I understand the powers of be telling him no. Right. I understand that we got to do something different. I don't think they really figured it out. It does feel like a very rushed, well, we'll just have some guards are transporting him and he breaks loose. It feels very half-assed. And again, that it's just, oh, he snaps his chains and beats a guy's head and, and steals her shotgun. And it's not really a very interesting sequence. It's not a very well-made sequence. Yeah, plus the female guard, she's on the other side of a locked door. Michael's already pretty much killed everyone in the little holding. You just leave him in there. Yeah. That's what the entire point of the holding cell is. If someone breaks loose while they're in there, he can still leave them contained in there. Right. No, she opens up the door, shoots another guard, and then he gets out, and then he kills her. It's just badly done. And they spin like a scene where we get introduced to the guards and they're making jokes about donuts and all that stuff and trying to like humanize them a little bit. But it just feels like Rob may have just resented having to do this and turn something out quickly and didn't really give it much thought. Oh, I just had a thought for what you could have done. What's that? Have that be the scene where we're introduced to now that Loomis is retired. Here's Michael's new doctor who comes into Michael's cell, introduces himself by saying he's taking a different approach. He's no longer going to coddle the baby and has orderlies come in and start stripping all the masks off the walls. And that's when Michael goes haywire. Yeah, that would make a lot more sense because especially since Michael can break through chains, why didn't he do this forever ago? Mm -hmm. He could have easily gotten out years before this. And you can have it be that that person gets away, but even as all the orderlies are getting killed and Michael still gets out and the hell have that be either Udo Kier or Clint Howard, who we see yeah. in the movie, trying to put the blame on Loomis for him getting out when they're the ones who are now responsible for him. You could just have one of them be like, yeah, we're not playing by Loomis's rules anymore. Ha ha. Oh shit. Oh shit. Yeah, it would have justified having Udo Kier, who should be a villain in every movie. And here he's just- <laughs> He's present. Yeah, he's there. No, and that, that would be interesting is now that they're no longer barred to Sam- one of them decides, well, I'm going to take a different approach, and it goes very badly. Mm -hmm. And that's what leads to Michael getting out. I could absolutely see something built around that. But yeah, especially since you introduce the whole room full of masks. I'm just picturing like orderlies going in and shoving them all into trash bags. And Michael just orderly goes up to take the one right off of Michael's face. And that guy's arm is gone now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have the scene with Danny Trejo and the other orderly, like, don't touch the mask. He doesn't like yeah, people touching yeah. the mask. It would have paid off that scene a little bit more. There's still alternatives you could have done. I don't begrudge them changing the scene. I just wish that it was a scene that was a little more care was put into. But I can understand, you know, the film is getting up on its release date. We don't have much time left. Director and the studio are butting heads over it and it's just finally relenting. Okay, we shot this in a day, you know? Yeah. I don't think it brings down the film as much as the original scene did. No. If I have to choose, I would definitely have this scene in the film rather than the director's cut. Yeah. And also, even with that, they did also cut down a lot of the orderly's dialogue. He still has a few exchanges here and there, but, you know, him going off about you people to Danny Trejo or yeah. some of his other lines to Michael. I'm glad those got left on the cutting room floor because now that he's no longer a character that really plays any importance in the plot, we don't need to linger on him any more than we need to. No. So some of the other stuff that was cut was the great bonding scene between Laurie and her mom over the skeleton that keeps falling apart. Oh, yeah, that was missing. I remember that now. Yeah. yeah. So that was an entire sequence between them. And then, you know, one thing I don't think we really talked about was I really liked, I know it's D. Wallace Stone as the mom, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to remember who played the dad. Pat Skipper as Mason Strode. Ooh, Pat Skipper. I love that name. I want a 70s sitcom starring Pat Skipper. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called The Skipper 2. I really liked D. Wallstone and Pat Skipper as Laurie's parents. We did talk about the raunchy way that Laurie teases her mom a lot, but I still like the way that there's a lot of good banter to that family, but there's also a lot of love. Yeah, I did like the family dynamic. I think that the theatrical cut loses a little bit of that, but it's still, you can kind of get it. You still have a lot of the good scenes, like them all sitting outside the house on Halloween or the stuff around breakfast table. They feel like a real family. They feel like mm -hmm. real people who have lived together who care about each other. We never really brought this up, but I did legitimately feel bad for them that they died. Yes. I don't know that they needed to, but it wasn't a badly made sequence. 
I think it sets up, and I don't know where they're going to go with it in the sequel, but I mean, it does show you how much Lori, even if she doesn't realize it at this point, she just loses everything in one night. Exactly. Exactly. Everything. Her very identity of who she thought she was. Right. And she doesn't have these people to go to for support. Further exploring that character really kind of reminds me of, remember the first death of Laurie Strode? Yes. Yeah, where again, it's like when she finds out that she was adopted, it just makes it impossible for her to connect to her family anymore. In this one, it's like, not only are you finding out you're adopted, but oh, by the way, they're dead too. Mm -hmm. You have nowhere to turn. And also your best friend. Well, her her best best friend is still alive, but deeply traumatized in her own way, and now finds out that she's deeply traumatized by Lori's brother. They're setting up, if you're going to do a sequel to this that does further explore Laurie Strode, there's some very interesting ways you could go there. Right. But we'll see what happens. Uh-huh. <laughs> Neither of us has seen part two, so we'll get there. Right. One little moment that I thought was interesting was when Laurie leaves the stuff in the mail slot at the house, we don't have Michael sniffing it anymore. Yeah. There is actually an extra scene in the director's cut of Udo Kier and Clint Howard where they're just very briefly in this movie with one scene with Loomis, but there's a whole other sequence that was cut in their office where right. they're all arguing about who's responsible for this and all that. Yeah, I noticed that I couldn't remember all the context of it, but I remember that Udo Kier and Clint Howard were in it a lot more in the director's cut. Yeah, well, I mean, it was really only one extra sequence, but it was like a few minutes. Yeah, it was. they were in two scenes as opposed to one. Again, hey, there was one extra one that they could have added, but hey. <laughs> Yeah, imagine if it was Udo Kier and Clint Howard in that sequence with Michael. It's like, hey, come on. <laughs> exactly. Get your money's worth. And then there was another entire scene of Lori, Tommy, and Lindsay all just kind of sitting around with the TV and joking around and Lindsay being like, I'm the Queen of Sheba, you must obey me. I think it was like a scene where we actually saw her and Tommy actually getting along really well. Yeah, that is something I miss a little bit. Is I really like the kids, and I think that they did a really good job of being genuine kids. I mean, they get a few moments here and there. They did trim out anything that didn't have to do with the boogeyman. Right. I'm glad they still left in one of my favorite lines in the movie. One, she's a girl. Two, she's not a boy. And three, she smells like you. <laughs> yes. I found them really charming, and I really think it made Lori feel a little bit more fleshed out just being around these kids and having a good relationship with yeah, them. And she actually played with the kids. Yeah. It'd be easy to make a babysitter character. Like, the kids are there as props, essentially. Yeah, like Annie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, yeah, I liked is that while you can tell that Lori is kind of annoyed by the kids, she also just genuinely care about them as people and knows how to connect to them. Yeah, especially Tommy. She yeah. really does get along with Tommy like he's a brother. Yeah. And then the only other major cut is that in the climax, we had the reveal that Loomis is still alive in the director's cut when he like grabbed Michael's leg as Michael was walking by. Right. In this one, they kind of ended on that note of he's probably dead, even though we know he's going to be in part two. (laughs) Yeah. Not a lot of big changes. Yeah. Other than the one scene with the escape, it's mostly just trimming. Are there other things that you would have liked to have cut? I would have probably cut a lot of Ronnie. Yeah. We didn't need the skull fuck line. No. I liked the actor whose name I cannot pronounce and I don't remember it off the top of my head, who played young Michael Myers. Mm -hmm. But I think you could probably cut out some of his dialogue. Mm. I like it when he's interacting with Loomis. I think when you have him shouting, like, I hate you and screaming with the mask on at the beginning of the film to Ronnie, it's hard to connect this whiny screaming brat to the Michael Myers we know. Yeah. When you flip the switch from innocent child to completely silent psychopathic killer, I can kind of see that flip, but when you have it be whiny and saying fuck you to the teacher and all that, it just makes him feel too human. It's a weird saying, but I think part of what Rob Zombie's trying to disassemble the Halloween mythos and rebuild it as more human and more relatable, more real world. The entire point of Michael is that he's not human and not relatable. Right. And it just doesn't work with that character. And I really think it is an interesting experiment, but I don't think it works. So I cut out as much as I can of make Michael seem more disassociated, Mm -hmm. more distant already before he kills anyone. Mm -hmm. Or go the other way and make him more sweet and innocent and make it seem like it comes more out of nowhere that he has this flip and goes down this dark way. I would cut Ronnie. I mean, not all of it. There's definitely lines of Ronnie I would cut just because it goes on way too long. Yeah. I actually wouldn't cut any of the bully being beaten because I thought that was a necessary scene to draw that out because that's Michael taking his first steps. Mm -hmm. 
Danny Trejo's character, I still don't know why they drag out his death, because he's a very painful death to see because he's a character you care about. His head being thrown into the water and that close-up of his face in the water, all you need to do is just cut out on that point. You don't need to have him be pulled out yeah. and go back in. Pull out and go back in. And then have the TV dropped on him. Yeah. That's overly cruel. Yeah, and him keeps saying, I was good to you, Mikey, over and over again. It's like, okay, we get it. I can see that the hurtfulness of that betrayal zombie was going for, but you don't need to dwell on it so much. Yeah, I would cut that down too. Well, and you already have the betrayal. The betrayal's already happened and it's already been reacted to. Now you're just lingering. Right. Again, in the climax you either do the scene where she's hiding in the wall or the scene where she's hiding in the ceiling you don't need both right i think her in the ceiling is necessary because when she falls out of the ceiling you know that leads up to the climax but you can cut out the entire scene of her hiding in the wall yeah that adds nothing to the sequence that's just another tension beat yeah i think this film's about what 10 minutes shorter give or take it's 11 11 yeah and you could cut out a good another five to ten minutes of it i was gonna say especially the climax i think that was where i really started hitting the display on my TV to show how much more time is left before we hit the end. I mean, there's stuff there that I like. I like what it ultimately builds to. Like, I like that moment where Laurie's fallen out of the ceiling and she's beat to hell. She's woozy and holding the gun. I still genuinely like the ending where she's straddling him and pulling the trigger and it finally clicks on the one bullet. That is still a good note to end on. Yeah, it's a very haunting ending in a good way, at least for this film. I still prefer the original Halloween's ending of, was that the boogeyman? But I think for this film, the style that Zombie was going for, it makes sense to end with just the horror of all this blood and what she just did and everything like that is pretty effective. Here's a question. Mm -hmm. Would you kill the killing of the parents and save the reveal that they've been dead for when the sheriff is trying to call them? Hmm. Yeah, I think that would be better, to be honest, because there's nothing very creative about the death or anything like that. I do like the way that the family just had this bonding moment on the porch. The daughter goes off with her friends. The mom goes inside. The dad gets one last puff of his smoke and then boom, Michael is on him, already has him dead. And then when the mom turns around, the last she ever sees of her husband is his body being slumped to the floor while Michael Myers is standing there. And it is a very haunting scene where, you know, he's forcing the mom to look at this picture of Lori as he's mm -hmm. killing her. But even then, the way he snaps her neck is not a very effectively done bit. No. And I think you could get almost the same effect by just having Michael go into the house. And then you cut away. Then you have the sheriff trying to call and then you see the bodies. I wouldn't even show Michael go into the house. I would just have be the family says goodbye to their daughter for the night and he has a little loving moment as they go back inside and then the next we see of them is just bodies on the floor as the sheriff is trying to get in touch with them. Mm, yeah, maybe. That might work too. I just think it might help to leave like a little bit of a question mark and then pay it off. Or maybe just have like Michael looking at the house and you don't know whether or not he's looking for Lori or is he going to go after the parents and then you get the answer or something like that. If you just had the parents, you know, they try to call the house and they're just dead with no real build up to that. I think people would be like, wait, what got cut? And the other thing is, one of my biggest problems with the movie is stuff you can't even really cut out, and that's still just Rob Zombie likes his trashiness. Right. Linda going off about the teacher and calling her a cunt and all that stuff. You can't really cut that without also losing the one scene where you have any development of Linda outside of the scene where she's killed. Right. I hesitate to cut that, even though I don't really like the scene. I noticed they did reframe her death scene, so you're not seeing any below-the-waist nudity. Mm. Doesn't really change the scene at all, though. No. I don't think her death was a bad scene. It, it was an exploitative scene, but it was a throwback to the original one. I was going to say, it was also pretty close to the original. She's a nude post-sex teenager getting strangled. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I'm not against some TNA now and then. It's all a question of how it's being used. But again, it's like the prolonged drama of like Annie on the floor. That's just very upsetting. <laughs> yeah. At least have her grab something to cover her up. It goes on too long. It, just seeing her bloody and naked, it's just disturbing. Well, especially then her father has to see her that way, which yeah. again is actually a very powerful dramatic beat, but it's a very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. If this was the father's story or if this was Annie's story, I could actually see that would be appropriate in the right context, obviously. But it just feels exploitive the way it's done. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think Daniel Harris was giving a great performance in it. I think her father comes in and sees her that way. It very much makes sense to why you don't see him play another part in the story because he's not going to take his attention away from this at all. Right. But again, the way Rob likes to linger on it. Mm-hmm.
Otherwise, I can't really think of much else that you could really cut or trim because I don't entirely agree on the stuff of young Michael. Again, I think the whole fuck you to the teacher is a little bit much. But I think there is a necessity to show that anger because I'm wondering if that snarly anger is the ugliness that he's trying to hide behind the masks. You know, in that scene where he's talking to his mother about why do you always wear masks because I'm ugly. Right. I don't think that's unnecessary. I think it's just the kid mixed with Rob's dialogue doesn't always click. Mm. I also like that you do have some warm moments between him and his mom. Yeah, that's actually the part I remember the most the first time I watched it was Sherry Moon Zombie, her reaction to seeing this kid that she loves, but at the same time is just completely horrified by what he's become. That I found to be really touching and horrific at the same time. I think what was nice about having those moments of connection is they give a contrast to how much he's starting to disconnect more and more. And then Mm -hmm. again, yeah, that final reveal where he kills the nurse, the mom takes his mask off and he's just roaring at her. And she finally sees this form that he's been hiding. Mm -hmm. I think that makes it very necessary. And again, I really like Shereen Moon's Ami in this movie and the character arc that the mom has. Again, is it Michael Myers? Part of that has to be, are we clinging to this puritanical fan vision of, that's not my Michael Myers? When, you know, there is room for reinterpretation. There is room for other interpretations. It just strays into the versions of the character that I've not been as enamored by. Yeah. I think it's a well-done character study of the build of a slasher film killer. Mm -hmm. Is it Michael Myers? Mm. Again, if he had gone through the entire rest of the movie just wearing that orange paper mache mask instead of Michael Myers mask, I think it would have been just as effective. Yeah, I think I said last time, I would totally watch, if you just take the first half of the movie, stretch it out over two hours, I think you could have a really good film. Maybe not as classic as Halloween, but you could have had like a really solid film that would have been completely original and just change the names. You keep out the William Shatner mask and you just do your own thing. I would have probably enjoyed it a lot more. It's just then all of a sudden you get the entirety of the first Halloween film crammed into an hour. It just doesn't work. And that's the thing is you're allowed to be revisionist. You're allowed to do your own thing. Yes. So I don't want it to sound like I'm being like, how dare you, Rob Zombie? So on the one level, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of this version of Michael Myers, who's a character I've been a fan of for a long time. But even just setting that aside, even just plucking that out, setting that aside and recognizing that that's just my own thing. I still think the film is uneven in that there's some things that I really, really like about it. There's some Mm -hmm. sequences that I think are really well crafted. I think some of the character studies and characters are really interesting. But I think Rob is also still very enamored in his trashiness. And there is an exploitative quality that I don't enjoy. That even just as its own film, there's parts of it that I enjoy and parts of it that I'm just repulsed by. And again, that repulsion is by intention. That's what he wants to do. It's just not my thing. And I get that. I'm a little bit more okay with the repulsion aspects to a certain extent. There's things like the rape that we discussed in the director's cut. That was just way too cranked up. And some of the other lines of dialogue, the skull fuck you and all that. It's there to be gross and it doesn't work for me. I appreciate some of the other stuff. If this was an original film as opposed to a remake, I think some of the ideas I would be a lot more okay with is just that it's my own biases and I totally understand it. Like you said, it doesn't necessarily mean that Michael Myers has to be this one thing, but I associate him so much with suburban living, which in the 1970s was still relatively new. It was only like maybe a generation or so where people were really living in the suburbs. So I can kind of see why Rob might want to revise that into being white trash. But I so strongly associate that in my own head. And it's just hard to completely decouple that. It just doesn't feel like Halloween to me. I could still admire a lot of the technical aspects of the storytelling and the acting and all that stuff. There are things I enjoy. It's just that at the end of the day, either version does not feel like Halloween to me. Yeah, and to a degree, this is a film that very much comes down on the divide between something that I think is bad and something that I just personally don't like. Yeah. I don't think it's a terribly made film. I don't think Rob Zombie is an untalented guy. It's just his taste levels and mind clash. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a version of Michael that while I don't think it's badly executed, it's just not as interesting to me as the classical take on Michael. And to be fair, the classical take was so ambiguous that everyone since then has been struggling on how to interpret it and how to build on it. Again, this is where I'm going back to what I said in the very first segment of the episode. I'm more at peace with this movie now. Again, when I did the old I Hate Love remakes episode on it like seven, eight years ago, oh, I hated this. 
I hated this movie. <laughs> I was like, how dare you? This is terrible. And now I'm just kind of like, you know, they set out, they did their own thing with it. And again, in I Hate Love Remakes, that was what was interesting. It was like also comparing this to Assault on Precinct 13, where they very much did their own thing with it. Was it as good as the original film? No. Was it as interesting as the original film? No. But it wasn't bad, and they did their own thing with it. And they did something interesting in its own right. And this is, Rob did his own thing. He played with the iconography in some interesting ways. I don't agree with it all. I don't like it all. There's stuff in there that he made terrible by intention that just is on a level that just doesn't play to me. I don't think there's a lot about this movie that's terrible unintentionally. Right. It's just not something that clicks with me. And even then, there's a lot of this movie that still does. So it's a film that I'm not liking it more, but I'm not as hostile towards it as I used to be. <laughs> I'm getting older, JD. Yeah. I can't cling to the hate anymore. <laughs> I don't have that many years left in me. And I think I'm becoming a little bit more jaded and cynical because, like I said, I think by the third time I've watched this, I had issues with it from the very beginning. Hey, JD. Hmm. Are you becoming jaded, Demot? You're fired, Noel. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and you'll no longer be hearing JD. His part will be played for the remainder of the episode by Alexander Adder. No, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Alex. Hi, everybody. Alexander Adder. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize, Alex. I do it with We love. love you, Alex. The more I watch it, the more I realize there's little flaws here and there. I think Rob's Piccadillo's great on me a little bit more every time. I still admire that he came to a remake and he clearly had his own vision. He didn't want to just rehash the original. He tried to do something with ambition and he put effort into it. It's just that it's not the type of film that I think you or I really want at the end of the day. What's going to be interesting is back when we did that remakes, Halloween 2 had already come out. And I'm like, I have zero interest in anything else this man has to do connected to Michael Myers. And now I'm just kind of like, you know, I'm curious. Yeah, that's about where I'm at. I already vaguely heard some of the things that happened in Halloween 2, a few things here and then. I'm just kind of like, even if it becomes further separated from the quote unquote classic Halloween and Michael Myers, I'm at least curious enough to see what he does with that. I'm curious to see where he goes, what he explores, especially in terms of Laurie. I actually, you know, Annie comes back at some point. I'm curious to see what happens with Loomis. I'm just like, you know what? It's time. It's time for me to sit down and see what he did with his continuation of his version of the story. And I'm at peace with that. Well, it's a shame we're not going to watch that film, so... I, we're, that's the next episode, J.D. Oh. 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 That's the next two <laughs> recording sessions because I'm making you watch it twice. Because again, we are doing both the director's and theatrical cuts, which I know are a lot different than what we had in this one. Yeah, I am curious too. I am really interested. I have not seen this one at all. I think I've heard some summaries of it on podcasts and whatnot, but I've never actually sat down and watched it myself. This is obviously was the end of the zombie era, and I'll be curious to see why that ended. Well, and we know there were sequels planned, at least one of which we'll be getting to. Yes, yes. Not by Rob. It was other people stepping in to pick up the reins from Rob. So I'm going to be very curious because I know part two goes very much in its own direction. How do you steer back from that? So before we finish ending the show, <laughs> we actually still had another segment where I was going to look at the box office release of this Halloween. Hey, I was trying to wrap things up and you I know. drag us back. I know. We still got more show left to go. Halloween came out on August 31st, 2007. Not in October, surprisingly, though I will at the end of this actually look at what came out in October. At the time of its release, films that were already in theaters were super bad. The Bourne Ultimatum, Rush Hour 3, The Nanny Diaries, Hairspray, and Mr. Bean's Holiday. Hmm. Halloween opened at number one. Yeah, I can see that. It's August, so yeah. Yeah, not a lot of competition. The only other films that opened that week were Death Sentence. I don't know if you remember that one. That was James Wan doing one of the Death Wish novels, adapting his own version with Kevin Bacon. <sighs> oh, I think I... Yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. That opened at number eight. <laughs> and then opening at number three was a film that I actually quite enjoy, Balls of Fury, the ping pong martial arts spoof. Oh, I had not thought about that film since about 2007 or oh, whatever. I've watched it several times since. I love it. So in its second week of release, Halloween dropped to number two, so it wasn't a big one, and that was because 310 to Yuma opened up in theaters. Okay. That was had a lot of Oscar buzz around that time, if I recall. Surprisingly, 310 to Yuma only got $19 million in that week. That's surprising. Hmm. And then the only other film that opened that week was Shoot 'Em Up, you know, that Clive Owen actual oh, yeah. which opened at number four. I enjoyed that one. I still haven't seen it. 
In its third week of release, Halloween is now down to number five. Opening at number six is D Wars. Uh, I don't know what that is. I can't remember if it's Chinese or Korean, but it was that dragons in the modern day oh, movie. Oh, yeah, I do remember that. I never saw it. Which you can hear me discussing on an episode of Mystery Movie Night, alongside the Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie and the Last Airbender movie. Ooh. Yeah. Opening at number three was Mr. Woodcock. Mm. Remember that one with Billy Bob Thornton? Yeah, and Sean William Scott. Oh, that's who that was. Yeah. And then opening at number one was The Brave One, which was that one where Jodie Foster kind of did her version of Death Wish. Hmm. No, I don't remember that one. In its fourth week of release, Halloween has dropped down to number 11. Opening at number seven was the Amanda Bynes movie, Sidney White, where they re- did a modern day retelling of Snow White. I'm also not remembering that one. <laughs> opening at number two was Good Luck Chuck. Okay. Wasn't that Dane Cook? Yes. Yes, it was. And Jessica Alba, I believe. Yeah. And then opening at number one, Resident Evil Extinction, the third film in the series. The one I didn't go see in the theater and I watched that later on Netflix and I was like, yeah, I think I'm done. And it's fifth week. Halloween opened at number 17. And at number two was The Kingdom, which I believe that was not like a, a war in the Middle East movie. I think so. And opening at number one was The Game Plan. I don't remember The Game Plan. It sounds familiar, but I couldn't tell you what it is or who was in it. God, we are at the fall dump of movies, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. I think five weeks being in the top 20, that's not bad for a horror film. In six week, Halloween is at 25, so we'll drop off here. Game Plan is still number one. What's Game Plan? Was that Adam Sandler? Dwayne Johnson. Oh, the one where he finds out he has a daughter. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that film. It's lovely. How did I forget about that film? Now that I see the poster, I remember ads for it, but I never saw it. I don't remember much about it. It's a very Disney movie. I enjoyed it. It looks very Disney, just looking at the poster. Yeah, I can see why that stayed number one. And then The Heartbreak Kid was opened at number two. And then The Seeker, The Dark is Rising opened at number seven, because that one never took off. Yeah. So Halloween, it had a budget of $15 million and did a total box office gross of 80 hmm. It did pretty well. Yeah, that's pretty decent. Especially for... For a Miramax horror movie of the 2000s. Yeah. And it was a remake and a lot of the like Platinum Doom stuff, they never really got past their first film. I mean, I think they were successful, but I don't think they did well enough to justify doing more. Yeah. Clearly, we're discussing next time Halloween 2, so this one did reasonably well. And then one other thing that I was curious to look at, they decided not to open the Halloween film in October. I just wanted to see what actually opened in October. Not really seeing like Elizabeth II, Lars and the Real Girl. Oh, 30 Days of Night. Yeah, I remember 30 Days of Night actually did pretty well at the box office. That would have been a big horror movie to compete with. Yeah, I could see that might have been stiff competition. Ooh, Gone Baby Gone. So we're getting into a lot of the, like, Reservation Row, we're getting into a lot of the award season movies. Right. So it's like Saw 4 and 30 Days of Night were really the only horror movies that came out in October. 30 Days of Night opened at the beginning of October. If you had saved this for a Halloween release, I think it would have done fine. Yeah, probably would have. I could see, like, maybe Saw 4 might have eaten some of their profits. How well could Saw 4 have done? Oh, $140 million. Yeah, okay. Against a $10 million budget, so good on you, Lionsgate. That series was doing theatrical releases for a long time. They still are. For something that could have easily gone to direct-to-video releases. Not to knock them, but I've still never seen a Saw movie. They sound fascinating with the, just the stories and the themes and everything, but it hasn't been my bag to jump into. I'll probably watch them at some point. Yeah, I think I watched like the first four or five, and then I was like, it's done. Hey, you're just cutting bone at this point. Hmm, like a jigsaw. Ah. So I think that's going to wrap up our episode on Rob Zombie's 2007 Halloween. At least we're ending on a less combative note than I did when I recorded about this eight years ago. Yeah. Probably because Evie's not here. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not Evie, so I'm usually not going to be nearly as combative (laughs) as her. I love you, Evie. We love you, Evie. We'll be back with Halloween 2. Good night, everybody. Good night. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. 